This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 485, recorded Saturday, October 12th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we're into. The podcast is available on all major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. Joining me this week is my friend Johnny, returning to talk about the Lord of the Rings rings of power pixel riffs on social media that matters everywhere including youtube where he hosts the minecraft survival guide and of course my co-host on the sponge chunks podcast hello my friend hey it feels like we've been hanging out a lot lately <laughs> it feels we like have. we've had a, a, lo- a lot of bonus stuff that we've done a lot of extra recordings two episodes of the citadel cafe back to back at this point it's been it's been a busy like september october for us yeah, I'm thwarting the game of like the guests coming on the Citadel Cafe and, and starting, oh, when was the last time I was in the show? And we start doing like math and figure out what episode and how many months yeah. it's been. It's like, no, it's last month. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> the just, one get, just get me on for the, the next episode. It'll be fine. Yeah, but obviously like this show has been coming out on a regular basis and, you know, we're skipping a couple of weeks worth of Citadel Cafe episodes to bring you the, the, the kind of wrap up at the end of season two of rings of power which yeah i'm excited to talk about but uh i'm sure there's plenty of other stuff that we can chat about in the meantime most recently actually you and i did an interview on the imp and skiz podcast yeah and that just came out yesterday uh and there's been a lot of really kind and lovely reviews on youtube uh for any folks listening here it's also available as a podcast on apple podcasts and spotify really wherever you're listening to podcasts i'm sure you can find the imp and skiz podcast uh, it is a video podcast, so there is a video component. If you do want to go and watch uh, Imp and Skiz and Johnny and I hang out and talk about podcasting, talk about the Spawn Chunks, the Minecraft podcast that we do, how we make it, uh, a little bit of our working relationship, and even a little bit into life as content creators, because uh, all four of us are full-time uh, podcasters and content creators. And it was a really fun way to just kind of sit down and and talk shop. And I mean, I, I don't know how long you have been familiar with Impulse and, and Skizzle Man, but I've been a fan of Impulse for a while. It was a real treat to start to have Impulse on the Spawn Chunks podcast, first as a guest and then as a fill-in host for you. But just to be on their show and and to be invited and to have them talk with us and, and give us such kind compliments on the Spawn Chunks, like it really tickled me to have someone that I look up to as a content creator be like, oh, I really like your show. <laughs> like It's just it's yeah. such a good feeling, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I've I've watched Impulse since season four of Hermitcraft because that's when I started doing the recap. And back then, I wasn't watching everything and taking notes to write the script with Zloy. Like Zloy was still writing the script all himself. But from season five, I picked up watching half of the whitelist, and so Impulse was one of the people I picked up earlier just to kind of get a feel for what he was doing, like the Redstone technical side of things. That was the season where they were all building in a Badlands, so there were all kinds of different projects going on. And yeah, I've been following Impulse since then. I've been following Skiz since he joined Hermitcraft, but obviously was aware of him and Impulse's Naked and Scared series. And so, yeah, it was always feels kind of surreal to talk to people, even though, like you said, Impulse has been on the show a few times. At least one of those has been without me there because I've been away. So it's kind of nice to uh, catch up, but feel like you still have a lot to talk about, but a lot of common ground at that point. And they feel like peers in the space, I think also in terms of like age, you know, I feel like there's a lot of people Mm -hmm. making Minecraft content, making kind of podcast content who are a little bit younger. Um, And obviously like you and I are, I'm in my late thirties at this point. And so like Impulse and Skiers feel like peers in just in terms of like age and life experience. They both held steady jobs for a while and have been in and out of the content creation industry and then, you know, are full time content creators now. So it feels like we've got a lot in common in that sense. Like we've got some life experience. I went out for dinner with a bunch of other Minecraft folks uh, in London when Fwip was visiting uh, with his wife. And so I met up with uh, Joel and Lizzie and a bunch of the other folks who I've, I've played with on uh, Empires and. SOS. And it's funny because uh, Joel and Lizzie are both, I'd say relatively young. I think they're in their 20s or maybe 30, like just turning 30. 
uh, and they basically started their YouTube channels when they were really young, and that's basically been the only career they've really had. Like, I don't think they've had, like, a full-time job anywhere other than making YouTube content, because that's just the era that they started in, and the popularity they achieved relatively quickly. And I'm like, man, what's that like? <laughs> because I started my YouTube channel when I was 27. So it's it's fun to meet some folks that you have a lot more in common with and just sit down for a good old chat. I don't know if I'm older than Skiz. I think I'm older than Impulse, but I don't know if yeah. I'm older than Skiz. I, I, not a subject that, that comes up because, as you said, like I think you kind of just kind of get the vibe of it. You're in that same kind of range. Um, but it's uh, I, I don't know. Like I feel like sometimes Minecraft fans are shocked to find out <laughs> that, I'm, yeah. that I'm older. Um, but it's uh, I think I've just always been young at heart. And that, I mean, that goes with my career, too. Like I started working in animation. I've always drawn cartoons. I did comics for a while. Like I feel like the, the, the kind of jobs that I've had, uh, even just as an illustrator, I did a lot of cartoon illustration. And that, I think, kind of keeps you young, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of keeps that lively, youthful, creative mm. spirit flowing. That Yeah, and yeah. video games is obviously going to be a field in which you get a lot of younger people, and so the demographic is going to skew younger anyway. Mm -hmm. But r lately on Instagram, I've been getting a lot of suggested like reels and stuff from a lady who's like in her 50s and plays Call of Duty, and she's like sniper granny or something like that. Like she's, <laughs> she's there I've like she's... That. she's yeah, literally a grandma, and she's, like, getting into voice chats with people, and they're all like, what, you're, like, 57 years old? And she's like, yeah, I just like to play. Uh, look out, bam! And just, like, <laughs> sniping somebody over someone's shoulder, and she's actually really good at the game. And so I'm, I'm like, is this targeted content? Is this, like, is it trying to nail what demographic I'm in, being, like, mm -hmm. a slightly older, like, very video games-focused person? But, yeah, it's it's a fun landscape out there. There's video games out there for everybody, dude. I've seen her before, and it is hilarious, because she's snarky but still very polite she's not vulgar yeah. or anything yeah but absolutely yeah but she like she'll make somebody so frustrated and she'll just laugh <laughs> yeah. like, oh bunny yeah, wow. yeah, yeah vicious and i've also seen um an older gentleman that was doing this very similar and he wasn't smack talking but i did get the feeling that he was ex-military like i got the feeling that he sure. probably was yeah, a sniper yeah. when he was in the military because he was talking wow. very technical about like adjusting scopes and like all this kind of stuff and yeah and playing a game that where that where that mattered but even then like to have that kind of skill you know like some of the people that i admire podcasting uh are now in their 50s and they've yeah. been doing it since they were in their 30s. Like these are people that have 20 years experience in this medium now. Uh, and um, they are, you know, still whenever I see them, like, you know, they're posting on Facebook or they're posting on Twitter. And when they're just doing a social post and they're not promoting what they're doing, it's like it's just the same as any other 20 year old that's posting. It's just like, here's my dog. Here's my lunch. You know, like, yeah. here's, here's a fun afternoon or, or like, here's a cool candy bar that I found. You should try it. Like just, just the simple things that people are sharing. It's like, you can tell that that um, creative, youthful spirit stays with people, like even when they're into, um, into their 50s. Because we are, we are getting into that generation where the people that grew up in the 80s and 90s playing video games are getting into their 50s, right? Yeah. You know, like the yeah. people that, my cousins and stuff that are, you know, 10 years older than me, you know, um, that were teenagers in the eighties and, and were really like, I was playing video games in the late eighties, like a Nintendo entertainment system and stuff like that. But th there's like the arcades in the mid eighties when teenagers would go to hang out. Like I, I was too young for that. Um, uh, but those folks are still very much video game fans and, um, and playing and they're, they're in their fifties and it's just, you don't think about it. Cause you and I, again, like with Minecraft, we think about the demographic as being so young. Um, or younger, I yeah. should say. It's not. It's not super, super young, but it's. It always has a young component to it, and and the game is designed like that. So it's interesting. Yeah. Um, speaking of games, that's what I've been doing the last month or so. I have been eat, sleeping, and breathing satisfactory. I've mentioned this on the podcast before. It's a factory building efficiency game, a sci-fi setting, very creative, a uh, huge time sink in the best way. Like it's the kind of game where you don't want to rush it. You want to take your time and just kind of enjoy all the different things that you can do and the building and the creativity. Uh, and it was released in 1.0 on September 10th. And it has been in early access for five years. I've been playing for almost five years. Uh, I actually remember I saw Exumavoid playing Satisfactory for the first time on Twitch one time. And that's how I was introduced to the game because I was following X's Minecraft content. And then he decided to, to switch up and play a different game. And so Minecraft led me to Satisfactory, really. 
And uh, I was hoping to upgrade my Devastator save, which is where I have about 1,200 hours put into the game, but it kept on crashing when I was loading up 1.0. And I've discovered it's not just a me problem. Uh, I had um, zero triple six uh, in our community uh, was able to remedy, uh, recreate the crash on their system uh, with my save file. So there's something about the resource management in Satisfactory 1.0 for, for some particular computers that is just a little bit sketchy. And so if you push it too hard, uh, specifically when I'm streaming, the game would crash. Uh, thankfully, the stream wouldn't crash, but it was pretty frustrating every 15 minutes or so to have the game crash. And uh, obviously, if you depending on how frequent your autosaves were, you might lose some progress. So uh, I opted to start a fresh new playthrough and have been enjoying it. I've had a lot of good feedback on it. Uh, some people that are new to the game are like, oh, okay, so this is how Joel handles starting out. And that's good because if you're new to the game and you're new to my community and you come in and I've got 1100 hours, like it's intimidating. Yeah. It's really hard to figure out what the hell is going on. And yeah. for me to go through relatively quickly, the tutorial and, and going through, I didn't do like a tutorial series like you do with your Minecraft survival guide, but I did sort of explain what I was doing. Um, look at some of the more efficient ways to do things, skip over some stuff that I was like, nah, I don't really need that right now. Like I'm not going to just go through this in order. I'm actually going to skip ahead to get the chainsaw or I'm going to skip ahead and get tier two belts or something to make my life easier down the road and um, not fall victim to like automating everything. Sometimes it's faster to handcraft a handful of things just to kind of get progression going. And so I went through that, had a really, you know, nice bit of feedback on that. And uh, I'm now at a point in the save where I've got 100 hours in in the new save uh, after streaming almost every day. And I'm getting to the point now where the time investment in the new save is getting heavy and I'm torn between pushing forward or trying to return to the Devastator save. There's been a couple of updates to the game. And I did show off the Devastator save on stream the other day and it didn't crash, but I only played for like 10 minutes. So I, I don't know what I'm going to do as of yet. Uh, right now, I'm just treating this new playthrough as building practice. I'd like to get to the point where I can finish tier three uh, and get to, or phase three rather, and get to like the rest of the game. So the way that it's split up is that phase one, two, and three of the space elevator basically divides tier one to three, four to six, and then seven to nine. Seven to nine being where the game has basically a lot of stuff opened up to you. And so I haven't quite got there yet. And so I'm, I'm hoping to get the save at least to there so that if I do return to it, I'm not feeling like I've taken a step back. I could have like a lateral, lateral save. And there are save editors. Like I could kind of grab everything that I've done uh, in this one little biome and bring it into the Devastator save and just kind of plunk it down and say like, hey, you know what? Let's just move forward. Let's just pretend that this was all the same thing. Um, and it might be worth doing. I don't know. Um, I... I did the Transformers theme in both saves, but Devastator was all Decepticon stuff. And then this new save is all Autobot stuff. But I could I could divide the map. Like I could have Decepticons on one side and Autobots on the other. That could be kind of fun. So, but that's where I am with it. It's been, uh, it's been a good time. Uh, I've really enjoyed streaming and, and sharing it and having some fun on stream with, um, with folks that have been enjoying the game. Still such a fun idea to theme the entire thing around Transformers. I feel I still oh, think that's like that's the stroke of genius that I think yeah deserves the attention that your satisfactory stuff is getting from other people in the community because I think in terms of obviously your artist background the fact that you're like sure I can use the colors and shape language of the different Transformers to make this stuff but it's also so tied in with the industry level that Satisfactory presents at, like the high technology kind of thing, the fact that it's slightly alien and there's a lot of stuff like that going on. I think it's it's a really smart way of designing stuff. And yeah, you end up with just some pretty rad color schemes, I think is the the bare minimum of content you get out of it. But I think it's it's really cool to see that stuff taking off. Well, thanks, man. I, I like the fact that I can get away with like the primary colors, you know, like you've got red yeah. Optimus Prime, yellow Bumblebee, you know, Wheeljack is white and green and, and uh, a little bit of red highlights. Like there's, there's a bunch of stuff that you can do to really kind of keep your playthrough from being super gray because there's a lot of metal, like there's a lot of metal texture and concrete texture in Satisfactory, as you would expect, you know, it's kind of paved paradise and put up a parking lot. That is the vibe yeah. for the game, right? Uh, and so mm -hmm. to be able to um, to use some colors and and know some tips and tricks and and get some brighter colors and stuff happening. That's been uh, a lot of fun. And something I think I mentioned to you as well is that to have 
color sliders and every color in the rainbow available to you if you want to use it is much different than like the 16 colors that you get in minecraft for dying something yeah the, like the bold primary colors um obviously we've got a lot of textures in minecraft but uh, and and you do in satisfactory as well but like to to get paints and get bright colors going on it's kind of fun to get away from the the doldrums of like the grays and the blacks and the silvers and the chromes and stuff like that from time to time yeah, Satisfactory has so many like prefab construction things in it. It's it feels very different different to Minecraft in the sense of Minecraft you're modifying everything on almost like a micro scale. Even though like when you're up close and building it in for, in first person, it feels like a macro scale in the sense of everything feels big to you when you're starting out. Like any house you build is like wow, that's a massive upgrade on you know the sleeping in a bed in a field that I had before. But then you look at the stuff that happens in Satisfactory, and it is so much more zoomed out on a large scale. It's oh, like man. how how can I place all of these like banks and banks of machines in order to get the optimized setup for what I'm trying to do? And so many of those things feel way bigger than the player, from what I've seen. Um, I watched uh, Julia from Drawfee play a stream on her um, like side project secret sleepover society. Um, and she started out in Satisfactory when the 1.0 release came out. And so I watched maybe like half an hour of that. And she was just zipping around, placing stuff. She's like, I've been playing this forever. I know where everything goes. And yeah, I was kind of baffled by the scale of some of that stuff when you're starting out. Because I think in your streams, I'd only ever seen stuff when you had a, a more well-developed factory. And you're like walking around in spaces that are designed for like, the player's going to travel around this way. So you've got all of these you know not like hyperloop kind of things and like tubes and mm -hmm. vacuum tubes to kind of transport you everywhere and so at that point it feels like the player's traversal matches the level of technology but i hadn't seen the stage where you're just running around like grabbing sticks from the environment and like oh, yeah. making biomass out of them and stuff and that feels very much more like the uh, ground level arc survival evolved <laughs> sort of style of it gameplay is. yeah 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 and so like it, it was really interesting to see both ends of the scale for me so yeah it's a it's a game that sure has a lot of depth yeah, my starter factory is the size of a football field. Like it's just it's yeah. massive. <laughs> you know, like several hundred meters yeah. wide, and it just it's yeah. The, it, the scale compared to Minecraft is just it's it's like someone stuck a straw in Minecraft and blew really hard, and everything just kind of yeah. goes pop. You know, like it's just yeah. really 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 far apart. But anyway, that's what I've been up to, uh, as far as my nerdy stuff for the last month or so. Um, what have you been up to? My games have been getting less virtual and more real life. Uh, so this is an odd one for me, but something that's sort of been in the works for a while. I attended my first meeting of a local tabletop RPG society, I guess you could call it. It's more of just like a loose collection of people coming together under a common banner. Um, there was a page just I found on Google searching for uh, meetups in the local area or like local D&D groups. And they had a social meet that was happening at a pub in, in town uh, very shortly after I signed up. So they have a Discord where they run a lot of their like behind the scenes chat and and people advertise their games in there for people who can't make it to events uh, but I turned up to this pub there were probably about 30 to 40 people there so it was a pretty good turnout and I thought it was just going to be you know you mingle you kind of have a chat with people have a drink with people but once I sat down the guy who was running the whole thing and welcoming everybody in and stuff said like are you interested in pitching a game and the idea I guess at these meetings is that you stand up and uh, explain what game it is you're running and then after that people come up to you and you know they they show some interest and they want to like join whatever it is you're you're playing and so I you know my first time there didn't really know anybody stood up with like the rule books that I brought along with me in case I was gonna like talk to anybody about them and was like okay so I have two games I want to run <laughs> and and talk them through it that has now led to me last night, actually, uh, running the first of several games of a system called Mork Borg, or if you're Swedish, Merk Buri, um, which is uh, the Swedish translation, I guess, is Dark Fort in English. Um, and it's a black metal themed RPG, very apocalyptic. It describes itself as rules light, heavy everything else. Um, and is is basically probably the closest thing I can think of to uh, like a world like Dark Souls, where everything is kind of brutal. Your character can die in like two hits if you're not paying attention, and everything feels a lot more vulnerable than Fifth Edition Dungeons and Dragons, which is the current I guess version of D and D and the version that I'm used to playing. And in that, you know, there are a lot of safeguards against player death because obviously people put a lot of effort into 
creating their characters and crafting a backstory and the stories and quests that you go on feel a lot more like epic heroic adventure where you're the protagonist and if you die then that feels like wow the the story ended in a really like bad way um but in morkborg that is kind of the point the idea is that the world is ending and you are just facing the apocalypse with eyes wide open so I really wanted to run this game with people. I'm planning on running it for the online group that I play D&D with, the 8-Bit Community guys who I stream on Twitch with. Um, but a few of them aren't able to participate this time around. So like we're, we're doing like a, a mixed group, like a different, a different group than what we usually do. And it's probably just going to be a one-off scenario instead of a long-running campaign. But I decided, sure, I'll try this with some people in real life. And we, we put a game together at a local place in Brighton. And... It was really fun. Uh, my first game of like actually running this turned out like a blast. Uh, the group nice. was a little shy. They they all seemed to like get into it after a while, but it was you know a new system to all of them as well. They nobody really knew each other, so it was kind of like we had to have a little bit of an icebreaker. The icebreaker came from the character creation process, where in Morkborg you typically you roll a lot of dice to just decide stuff at random. Like, you, you decide whatever meager possessions your character has instead of, like, choosing them from a list. And so I was telling everybody, okay, roll a die, roll, like, a 12-sided die, and I'm going to look up a table of whatever you roll, that's what you get. And so one person got, like, a small but vicious dog that was very loyal to them, and they were like, <laughs> great. And then the next person rolled, and I was like, okay, now roll a four-sided die, and they rolled a three, and I was like, okay, you have three monkeys. <laughs> and they just had, like, you know, these extra kind of followers. Uh, somebody else had a donkey that could help them carry goods and then this entire group there were four players plus me kind of running the story uh they all had to go off to a uh, a valley of the unfortunate undead where there's this sort of history in the world that's explained a bit in the core rule book of how uh as the world was formed, these two two-headed basilisks started to basically run the world behind the scenes. They're sort of like the basilisk Illuminati, and one of them has predicted all of these prophecies of the end of the world. As you play through the game, those prophecies come true. There is a mechanic where you roll a die, and every time you roll a one, another misery befalls the world. And it's like, you know, the, the end of the world in revelations from the bible or something like that where like the trumpets sound and the gates of hell are opened and all of this horror starts pouring out and the you know all of the water becomes blood and that kind of stuff like, it's really kind of heavy metal album cover imagery right and so yeah we were we were just playing through this game having a blast i wrote a little scenario for it and they were investigating this ancient kind of tomb trying to find the skeleton of this basilisk who had died there and uh, running into all kinds of stuff. Uh, an entire room exploded at one point, uh, which is very fun to narrate. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot as I'm doing this, but I'm I'm having a blast. I'm planning on running the same scenario with a different group at some stage and just compare notes for like what the first set of players did versus the second and maybe develop this scenario into something I can run with a few other groups as well as long as nobody was in the previous group and knows what's going to happen, I feel like I can refine it to the point where it becomes a really compelling starter adventure to get people into the game and interested to discover what's next. It sounds really free compared to maybe more of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I mean, I'm yeah. coming from the outside of the of the, the tabletop world, but I, I have played D&D once uh, in terms of once as an organized fashion. I've played a couple of like, one-off campaigns at like uh conventions and stuff like that just like hour long sure, yeah. sort of things but i i did a, a a weekly group for a little while and i liked it but it, de it definitely had a structure like there was a lot yeah. more it felt like a lot more structured than Mork borg has as far as you know what i've come to understand from your explanation of it and i'm wondering is there any tools or I guess, strategies that you could take from your experience with running a Morkborg campaign that you could take back to D&D? &D? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think Morkborg even says a lot of its own rules are compatible with the settings of larger, like, well-known RPGs like Dungeons & Dragons. There's mm. a few rules that you can crib from it. The core rulebook is really designed more as a toolkit for you to use than like a specific adventure you have to follow and a character progression and stuff basically 
it has a lot of similar ideas in that, you know, you roll some dice to decide whether you hit with an attack or miss. Um, the way Morkborg does it, the enemy creatures don't roll. You just, like, get swung at and you roll to evade them. So it puts a lot of agency on the players for combat rather than the agency being just on the individual performing the action at any given time. There's there's a few things like that that I would love to like hack into D and D games in future, and I think rolling on tables to have all of these kind of random events happen, it becomes yeah a bit more chaotic in the sense that it's organized chaos. You know, it, all of the all of the stuff is being determined by dice, but the dice are in charge of some really wacky stuff happening, and so yeah, I, I think both in terms of dungeon planning and in terms of abruptness of actions and the chaos that that can create i think i'm interested in incorporating a lot of that stuff into the kind of more serious long-term uh stuff that i plan on running in systems like DD. it's wild like my brain just kind of goes to a small but aggressive dog with three monkeys riding on its back like three kids in a truck <laughs> just you know, <laughs> yeah. the wild yeah absolutely sort of like absolute nut bar kind of things it reminds me of um uh is it Shaun of the dead like the 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 comedy versions of any apocalypse movie where you just there's just yeah. these things that they think are funny that become like memes for the rest of the internet for all time because they just they yeah. never thought you know like that sparky the dog was going to be like this giant character and i can just see this small but aggressive dog being a huge part i guess it depends on how that person wants to to play like are they going to lean into that or is the dog just going to become like a silent companion the the guy with the three monkeys was very attached to the fact that he had monkeys. It was great. Like the well, at one point he sent one of the monkeys across the room before this room exploded. There was like a big tar pit that gets set on fire, and the monkey was trapped on the other side and got dragged off by one of these cult members who was trying to perform this ritual in the central chamber of this of this underground tomb. And as soon as I led them into the kind of final boss arena and I was like, and you know, and strapped to this altar ready to be sacrificed is your monkey. And he's like, I'm going after my monkey. <laughs> it was just the, the, the fact that it, it started out just being one of those absurd like icebreaker. We're all laughing at the fact that there are monkeys in this game, actually. But then emotional attachment starts to form and then suddenly the monkey becomes like the driving emphasis for the plot, which I think was, was kind of great. That's amazing. That's it's it's crazy the the kind of fun that you can have i i always have trouble with that like i remember when i was playing D, i think there was a couple people that were a little bit more on the silly side and they would lean into more stuff like that but i think most of the people there were more of like a lord of the rings fans and they want, kind of wanted to have more of like a serious fantasy adventure and i was kind of in that pack i think i've mentioned to you before that i had like a dragon kin i think is what they're called and like mm -hmm. and he was just a big brute with a sledgehammer and trying to smash stuff like I just, you know, I was playing a bar barbarian or a warrior or whatever the big the big muscly class was. And uh, I wasn't so much goofing off, but like I still had to lean into the fact that I was getting terrible rolls. And despite the fact that I was the size of a, a truck, I couldn't hit anything. And it was just yeah. bad luck, bad rolls, bad whatever. And uh, eventually, like there had to be. um some sort of like in jokes where like i would be up to do something it's like should i try and smash it and people are just like i don't know can you like you're yeah yeah you're, you're you're a full three feet from it do you want to step a little closer it's like well <laughs> maybe <laughs> like just and that you kind of have to roll with it you really have to um loosen up i feel to to really get the most fun out of the D D or any tabletop scenario really like you have to be open to the story and open to the game of yes and as opposed to having yeah. your own kind of like myopic way of of how you might want to move forward because there i mean depending on how you roll with it like you could really suck the fun out of it for everybody else if you're a little bit too much of a stick in the mud you know yeah yeah i'm definitely one of the more easygoing gms who will try and yes and people wherever possible because i think everyone's ideas are going to contribute to the telling of a good story mm -hmm. and if somebody wants to like you know do something that's clearly not possible then i'll try and figure out like how can we do something that's the closest possible to this i will know but stuff that i cannot yes and for mechanical reasons um and and it's still like a nice way of making people feel included and and the dice are really like the other collaborator in the setting right and so yeah even if it feels like you're failing you need to still be failing forwards and that's the really important thing to keep momentum going in a game is making sure that even if somebody's rolling bad, if it's just the whims of the dice and they're getting frustrated about it, there's still ways in which that can contribute to 
the direction the scenario goes. So like you stumble, but hey, you stumble across like you you, you stumble on the floor and that you know maybe overturns the corner of a carpet revealing a trap door that you didn't see before or something like that right like there's there's maybe little things like that that you can work into making somebody who's having a bad experience still feel like they're contributing so that's that's the philosophy i try and take into running games like this i'm planning on running a couple of other systems besides morkborg as well when uh last year at around halloween i ran a still fleet campaign still fleet's a, a sci-fi like very very millions of years far future kind of setting um, that draws really heavily on like sci-fi masterworks of like the kind of 70s and 80s and like a few other major influences but is very kind of politically driven and um, has a lot of really interesting mechanics and world building in in the core rulebook which is much bigger than Morkborg. It feels much more like a uh, a world bible kind of thing rather than a just a toolkit but um, yeah still fleet I want to run locally as well. It's surreal going from running stuff online to running stuff in person and having that instant feedback and not feeling like everything has to wait for the zoom call to catch up or whatever and so i think still fleet is going to be a bit more dynamic and interesting in person but that's going to be a longer campaign that's going to be character creation is a whole session and we talk about the world and understand like how the scenario is going to function and then probably do a few different sessions running through like plot and i'm planning on maybe running the same venture that i did with the the 8-bit community group last year which took maybe like five or six sit downs with everybody before we got through the entire thing so it's going to be more than just like a pickup game you know it's going to be a, mm -hmm. a uh, at least a a few months i imagine of of regular meetings to uh to get through a a decent chunk of campaign but that's super fun and it seems like there's a lot of other people in this group who are into other systems than D D as well like a lot of people were pitching some really interesting stuff at the meetings so i'm looking forward to maybe joining a couple of games as well and seeing what else is out there that's fun too when you, you don't have to always be the one running it like you can show up and and just enjoy yeah. the the process and take part in the creation but not have to have the responsibility of of steering the ship it's kind of like you know what you and i were talking about last weekend when we were on the imp and skiz podcast like we didn't really have to prep for it like we were being interviewed and it's so often when you and i are, are doing a show even this one as as casual and as fun as the sigil cafe is like you still have to prep some notes and some thoughts and you know get ready for it whereas you know being interviewed on imp and skiz was just like we would, we would just show up this feels just good, show up yeah but weird <laughs> like it's yeah it's, it's funny when you're being interviewed or the thing that you are talking about is something that you are so well versed in that that very very little prep is required and i think that when you are running a tabletop campaign versus participating in one as a player um while i know they're very much involved from both sides like there's got to be a little bit more of a relaxed experience on the player side from what i can imagine yeah. Well, moving on to what we've been watching and speaking of character creation and character origins, I do want to give a quick shout out and mention to the fact that Steven and I went to go see Transformers 1 in theaters a week or two ago. The plan was to talk about it uh, on the Citadel Cafe a lot sooner, but uh, Steven's schedule has been a little bit hectic. So we're going to talk about it the next time he's on the show. Uh, it's always fun to talk about uh, a movie that we have seen like together we're both on the same page but also we went to go see it here in the city the fact that he just lives down the road means that we could actually go out to the theater and have that experience which is great uh, i will give a quick spoiler free review and that i really liked it and i think mm. it's worth seeing in theaters and i would encourage people to go do so because i don't see a lot of animated features that are like this in recent years and i really feel like as audience members it's good to kind of vote with your dollar and go see things in theaters if they are doing something a little bit more unique. And not only was it just very cool visually, I mean, it's Transformers and it's completely CG animated. Think like DreamWorks, Pixar, like that kind of level of, of uh, cartoon. Yeah. And that really loans itself well to Transformers. Like there's, you don't have to worry about organic stuff. Like it's all super uh, metal and transforming and, and energy and all that stuff. And they handled a lot of very interesting things uh, uniquely in terms of like, how energy works, how energon works, how transformers get around, what, how do they transform? And there was a lot of comics lore, generation one cartoon lore. And really the, the show is about, or the movie is about the relationship between prime and Megatron before they are even prime and Megatron. And uh, the character development in this movie was better than most in terms of an animated feature. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to push it is that 
it's not just flashy transformers doing stuff it's there's a there's a story there's pathos there's a lot of emotion involved and um i really really liked it there's a few modern jokes that aren't really my thing a bit tropey but like there's also a lot of nods to the spirit of the classic franchise that i think people that are my age and and around that kind of generation will get and appreciate and will pull those away at rather than like the, the jokey stuff for the kids that are meant to keep like the, the younger kids entertained through the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really highly recommend going to see it. Uh, Steve and I will talk about it more in detail the next time that he's on the show. Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power season two, however, is going to be the main topic today. And uh, we'll give a spoiler warning. There's no way to talk about this without spoiling uh, the, fi the final few episodes. Uh, the season finale was just last week. I think it was the eighth or the fifth or something was the final show. Yeah. Uh, it took me a couple of sit downs to get through the last two episodes. And so I'm a little bit vague on when they come out uh, and when, like what episode is what. So my... I guess spiel here will be kind of like the second half of the season as like one chunk. Cause I didn't really yeah. watch it episodically. I kind of watched it in bits and pieces as I had a chance. Um, but overall I think it was pretty good. Like I think the production value remained high. I'm thinking back to what we talked about in the last episode. Uh, I think the um, character development and the emotion behind those characters and their development was better in this season than once last season um there were some things that were a little bit forced maybe but most most of it i think was was really really strong um standouts for me were performances by morpheth clark uh which i think i mentioned last time and i'm looking up his name really quickly so i don't forget it uh charlie vickers as sauron i think yeah. this season way better like i said that at first but throughout the season especially the last two episodes maybe really started to show a range and almost like a mad scientist range of of emotion and motivation for sauron and i really enjoyed that i think they leaned into that and that was a strength this season rather than the who is he? What is he? Where is he? Kind of like mysterious way that they kind of teased Sauron throughout the first season. This was a lot more real flesh and blood threat um, with um, powers that we don't always understand. Like it, it was very interesting to kind of get that um, almost super villain rundown of like, what can he do? How do we fight him? Uh, yeah. as, as they rolled through the season and it wasn't like smack you in the face like that as, as it can be in some of the marvel movies but it's just one of those things where you're like oh okay this is this is gonna be tricky like how how do they uh get around this it's it's a an interesting way to portray but i i think that those are the two big things for me from the season what stood out for you i think honestly the Celebrimbor, anatar quote unquote anatar sauron uh, relationship is the highlight of the season. I think that was absolutely what stood out for me as the memorable part, the best performances were there, and of course it's the principal focus of the show, the Rings of Power. They are crafting both the seven dwarf rings and the nine human rings throughout the course of this season, and it's throughout that that things absolutely fall apart around Celebrimbor, quite literally, even though for the majority of the season, he can't see that happening. Mm. And that's a really fascinating dynamic to explore. But more generally, like you, I really enjoyed this season. I think it's an improvement on season one. This continues to be an 8 out of 10 show that looks like a 10 out of 10 show. I think the production yeah. design, the, the, the scale that it managed to achieve, really feels commensurate with the scale people expect after the Peter Jackson trilogy of Lord of the Rings and obviously The Hobbit I think has the same kind of scope but I think The Hobbit fell much flatter in terms of stringing everything together making it feel coherent what they did with dialogue what they did with character that's the stuff I didn't like so much about The Hobbit trilogy that felt a bit more like a children's movie combined with a theme park ride whereas Lord of the Rings actually feels like the epic fantasy adventure that jumped off the page to me in the way that I've always loved the the stories uh, Tolkien wrote of, of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit um, and this is obviously kind of what Tolkien wrote and kind of their own take on a lot of these events. A lot of these deviate from canon in a way that some people find objectionable and I find works when it works. Mm. <laughs> because going back to Celebrimbor and the crafting of the rings, the order in which the rings are crafted differs from the books. In the books, the nine and the seven are crafted before the three elven rings are. And basically it's because Sauron 
teaches them a bunch about Ringcraft and injects his own power into them and then leaves and the three Elden Rings, uh, the Elven Rings are made in secret. Whereas in this, they've sort of done both in that he's there and then he leaves and then they craft the three Elven Rings, but then he comes back and they make the nine and the seven and uh, under this sort of cloak of deception. So it's inverted to show Celebrimbor's downfall and show Sauron working in Eregion to influence the crafting of the rings in a way that feels like it can escalate to a dramatic conclusion at the end of a season of television, rather than it being something that happens as like a historical account is what we read of it in Tolkien's writing. And I think it's one of the most effective changes they made for the show. I think it really works that they craft the elven rings first, and while the elves are figuring out, what does this mean? Should we even use these? Was Sauron kind of involved? He's already there working on the seven and the nine and corrupting Celebrimbor and cutting him off from the rest of elven society. And a lot of that insidious nature of Sauron being the great deceiver is really highlighted in those scenes. So yeah, that's far and away the best thing about season two. I think it was really, really well executed and has that kind of political intrigue element baked into it in a way that's going to please fans of stuff like Game of Thrones, where it's all about political maneuvering and power and getting one over on somebody and, like, drawing the wool over their eyes. But in this case, it feels a lot more magical in nature, and they're working on magical artifacts, and so that very high fantasy Tolkien stuff is still baked into it as well. Yeah, I found that Sauron was playing the long game, but playing it impatiently. It was a really weird dynamic because there's a couple of points in the last few episodes where um, Anatar Sauron loses his patience and like raises yeah. his voice or shouts or demands. When the really, cracks start to show. Yeah, yeah, when he's really trying to like slowly manipulate Lord Celebrimbor throughout the, the season. Uh, but he's also you know, seen smirking on the wall of Eregion as uh, Adar and the Urks approach to attack. And you can tell, and I mean, you're, it's foreshadowed through, I think, dialogue from Galadriel that this is exactly what Sauron wanted. Like he, he yeah. wants the Orcs to destroy the elves so he doesn't have to, then he's going to somehow remove Adar and he's going to take over the Orcs. And uh, something that I really liked about the development of not just Sauron's powers as, as they were revealed, but the fact that he is just manipulating and betraying everyone, not just, yeah. not just a, not just the good guys. Like he will betray everybody. Nobody is safe. And you realize like the mistakes of the small minded or the mistakes of the people that trust him emotionally uh, and then end up being under his power. And especially the Uruks, like you, you, you almost feel bad for them in this series. Like they did a decent job of portraying Uruks as a society, as yeah. living, feeling beings, not just monsters with teeth that drool, you know? Yeah. I think that's another, another one of the more effective things that they do is they're making Orcs in the second age feel more sympathetic and more like a culture and a culture that is then completely subservient to Sauron by the third age and I think that's that's actually really effective obviously the character of Adar has been a much more sympathetic father to them and you know that Sauron is just going to start treating them like cannon fodder when they become his army but the weirdest part about that is the orcs thrive under Sauron like the army of Mordor grows so vast that like the the men in Gondor and you know the forces of the elves and stuff can barely hold them back and he kind of zerg rushes in season three in, in, in the, the third age he like he starts to uh see everything as like a numbers game and like he's just gonna overwhelm middle earth with this this dark force so the orcs the uruks in season two of the show almost feel like a, a smaller band and they feel like a faction of similar size to like the humans of the Southlands or the, the the elves to a certain extent now that a lot of the elves have gone back west to Valinor, whereas they're just going to become an overwhelming force in the Third Age. So it's kind of interesting to see the genesis of that. I'm still struggling to remember like even how they introduced the orcs and the uruks in season one. Like I just, all of a sudden they were just there. I just, I don't recall any kind of grand buildup or slow development or any kind of backstory. 
to it. And I know it's there. And I know that at some point they were elves that were twisted and then they're like the descendants thereof. But it like, I, I just, they're so different uh, than everything else in this series. And yet yeah. they're so similar to everything that we've seen from orcs and Urks in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So you're like, okay, wait a minute. Like, so they haven't changed much in an age, but like, how did they, you don't see the gradual kind of, um, transition. Whereas I feel like I can look at the elves as portrayed in rings of power and what I saw of the elves in Lord of the Rings. And I can see like a, a transition. I can see like growth and I can see a different society and how they grew to become more peaceful and ethereal and stuff like that. Versus now they're very, they're very, um, I'll say violent. Like they're just, they're quick to arms. Um, militaristic. Quick, yeah. Uh, militaristic. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, quicker than I than I thought. I mean, I'm not complaining. To your point earlier about the show looking like a 10 out of 10, I would love a set of Elven armor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, Does it yeah. look badass? Like, duh. I mean, uh, uh, the King's armor is really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like Elrond. Uh, and, and Galadriel also has some really cool... She's more of a... She doesn't have like a heavy armor so much as she's... She's usually in like a, like a, a bodice or a chest plate with more free-flowing arms and stuff. And um, the other elves, especially the horseback uh, elves, have a lot heavier uh, armor going on. But it's it's really really cool. And something that they did portray really well too, so talking about like being quick to arms, uh, the fighting uh, and the strength of an elf was really shown. I think in this season to the point where like you're looking at this horde of orcs coming across this blocked river at a dozen elves and you're like this is how are they even going to survive and then you see one elf it's, take out five orcs in like a blink you're like yeah. oh oh okay wait a minute this is different there's it's not it's not a one-to-one -one here um elves still die but like it takes seven arrows to fall one it's like it's there's a lot of um stuff they kind of communicate quite clearly in that the the strength and the even like the, the stronger life force we'll call it of an elf compared to some of the other beings in middle earth is uh, is a lot different and it takes uh, a lot more to stop an elf and it also um allows an elf to do a lot more than just what you think of as a single person could do yeah yeah like uh, fans of akira kurosawa movies and seven samurai specifically will understand how the uh, the distribution of ninjutsu and the like how seven samurai can successfully uh defend a small village from an, an army of mercenaries and invaders right like that's the that's the whole the whole thing is they they've got the uh the power of good on their side and with elves of course they're meant to be like harder to to fell in battle immensely stronger and they undergo this decline from the first age where they're at the peak of their power basically down to the third age where as we're seeing in this show their presence in middle earth diminishes and they all start to just leave the world and uh, travel off to the west but yeah like it's it's really cool to see elves fight we see a glimpse of it of course in the prologue and in elrond's flashback to the war of the last alliance um in the peter jackson trilogy so you see hugo weaving at the head of an army and they're all mm. like using those double-bladed spear sword things that don't look especially practical to use in battle but there we go and yeah, like you, you get the sense that they had this great host at one point in order to oppose Sauron. That is what this show is theoretically building towards. If we're seeing the end of the Second Age, that is the final battle of the Second Age. So the fact that we're seeing the elves' military power at this point really prefigures them making a last stand against Sauron as he gains power, forges the One Ring, and tries to dominate all of Middle-earth in the Second Age. Something that I really liked is how they portrayed Sauron's speeches about his plans uh he wants to save middle earth in his yeah, mind like yeah. he wants to fix it uh as if it is broken uh and he's it's he is delusional in a very human way uh i think it like for me it just rings of like even current world politics or uh, different world views right now and uh, worldviews of the past when you think about when Tolkien was writing these books and the yeah. world events in, in the mid 1900s. And you're just like, man, like, th like it's, it's, it's evil. Like what he's doing is evil, but he's delusional and like he believes in it and he's emotional about it. Like he's not hell bent on power verbally. It might be something that's his underlying motivation, but 
he's really more of a, uh, I will fix this chaos with order and I will force the order on everybody. And it's like, it really kind of rings true to um, world wars and, and other things that, you know, humans have endured over the centuries. And I liked that about it. Like I liked that, that they gave it that clear emotional motivation for him. Like it just wasn't just evil for evil's sake. Uh, cause in Lord of the Rings, like, I mean, you, you barely see Sauron in, in physical form other than flashbacks and he's just, he's the evil for evil's sake. Like he's the dark shadow. It's, it's the, the nameless fear, all that stuff. Whereas in this, yeah. you get more of a, uh, Greek God descended from, you know, the pantheon, uh, emotional distraught, uh, lashing out and saying, I know. I'll do this as if like it's trying to fix his own psychological lapses. He's like, well, what I need is I need to feel this. So I'm going to bend the world to my designs in order to feel good about myself. And it's just, it's such a twisty uh, motivation for a character. And, and they do that very well in that, you know, like he, he's also outwardly twisting everybody and and no one should trust him people still somehow do i don't know how he manages to do that uh but i i really enjoyed that that part of it i remember you know to talk about Celebrimbor and the i guess the the way that sauron manipulates him and gets him to do the things especially after he has um discovered that anatar is sauron yeah, once the cards are on the table kind of thing, yeah. And yet he still is able to convince him to complete the rings. Like, I, just, I, I found that it was yeah. well done. I mean, under like, duress, he's, like, shackled to a table literally at that point. So he kind of he kind of has to. But the sense of, like, the stakes change, but the task doesn't. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, you, you'll make the rings of power because it's the right thing to do. You'll make the rings of power because, you know... You, you want to correct your mistake you'll make the rings of power because that's the only thing that will save this city uh you'll make the rings of power because i tell you to it's kind mm-hmm. of like the 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 progression of things and yeah like that that's going back to what you were saying about sauron's motivations he has this very the ends justify the means kind of approach to all of this and the ends in this case is peace in middle earth and the means are I will dominate the will of everything and control everything. And and that's kind of in opposition to some of the stuff they're doing elsewhere with different characters. We'll get back to Celebrimbor in a second because I, I want to say something about his like death scene. Mm. Um, but if you, if you look at what's happening in Rune with uh, the stranger who we eventually, spoiler alert, find out is Gandalf, was Gandalf the whole time, and in retrospect is incredibly obvious that he was Gandalf. Mm-hmm. He's talking to Tom Bombadil, and Tom Bombadil is telling him, you know, you can't consider yourself master over things just because you want power. Because, you know, who are you to be master of, like, the trees and nature and everything? You've got to listen to it and respond to it and work in harmony with that stuff instead of trying to impose your will over things, and that's the right way forward. So you have that contrasted with Sauron doing the absolute opposite, and that's really the balance of good and evil in Tolkien's world and in the world of this show is that if you're trying to manipulate everything and have it serve your will that is evil if you're trying to work in harmony with something and accept that what will be will be to a certain extent then that is that is good you can help to you know manipulate things a little bit as long as you don't use this ends justify the means philosophy behind things you just help things in the right direction help things to be what they were always destined to be and under the will of the valor the kind of ruling gods of tolkien's pantheon they have a grand plan in place the place the, the plan that was sort of handed to them by iluvatar who's sort of the the outer god of basically everything there is this fated design that has been imposed on the world from the beginning and it's about do you work with that design do you serve that design or do you try and corrupt it to your own ends which is very much what sauron is trying to do um and Celebrimbor really tears into him when he's dying and i think that's one of the coolest scenes that those two get to do together because at that point like you said Celebrimbor's been enslaved by sauron he's making the rings he's under duress he just has to he thinks maybe it will save the city maybe he's just desperate and wants to do what this guy says at this point 
and then in the final episode, Sauron is literally like shooting arrows at him, like at point blank range, and Celebrimbor is still defiant. He sort of regains some of his own whatever the alpha version of humanity would be. He regains some of his own dignity, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the final moments where he's effectively prophesying that the rings will be his downfall. And he says one alone will bring your ruin. And obviously that's a reference to the one ring, but also the fact that Frodo, or maybe even Gollum, if you want to go that far, is going to be a single individual that is responsible for his ultimate destruction. And there's a really neat poetry to the way that is phrased that leaves it open to interpretation for any number of the individual things that lead to Sauron's downfall. I think it's really well done. Something that I really got out of that too was that at that point, even though the rings have been forged, he has given them to Galadriel. And yeah. that conversation is not about you will make the rings. It's about you will tell me where you hid them or where they are. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Celebrimbor finally has an opportunity to have one up on Sauron because yeah he, he just, has the power in that moment yeah, yeah he has the power and and uh Sauron is while he's torturing him he's basically gaslighting him saying like you know what like, why why have you done this to yourself like if you are bringing this on yourself like it's not me shooting you with arrows it's you making me shoot you with arrows and what I liked so much about it is that uh Celebrimbor takes the intellectual approach to twist and manipulate Sauron's emotions. Um, eventually, mm -hmm. Sauron snaps and sticks him up against the wall on a pike, which is like not gory. They didn't go too far with it, but man, it was just brutal. And, brutal and like an end. Like you, re there was there was a real um, point to it. Pardon the pun. Yeah, it just it, re it like <laughs> it really it wasn't just like a sword stab or a knife stab or because that happens so much in the show where people get stabbed through the side and they die. This was just more of a real poignant moment for Celebrimbor. But in that moment, you realize that Celebrimbor is doing two things. He is escaping all this suffering. He is depressed and ashamed of the work that he's done, what he's allowed to have happen, and the fact that he had the wool pulled over his eyes. But in one last effort to not commit suicide, but twist Sauron into murdering him, he also takes the secret to his grave. In, I mean, later yeah. on, of course, Sauron ends up finding the rings when he fights Galadriel. But still, it's like it's one of those things where in that moment, even though he dies, Celebrimbor is victorious. Right. And yeah. I really I liked I like that scene a lot. And I and I think you're right about like their relationship and the performances between uh, Charlie Edwards and um, sorry, Charles Edwards and Charlie Vickers. Um, both both Charlie's there um, was really, really good. I really like them. I'm trying to remember what I've seen Charles Edwards in before. I think he was in Downton Abbey. Maybe, yeah. yeah. He seems like the the actor who'd fit well with that kind of cast. <laughs> yeah. I can see him him doing well there. But yeah, like I I love the fact that he not only goes to his grave keeping the secret of who has the the nine rings, but he also goes there reminding him, "Hey, I'm going to live eternally in Valinor, which is a place you can never go to. Mm. Like you've you've gone too far. The Valar would not possibly let you in. Like you're a servant of Morgoth at this point. You have been cast out for a reason." And basically that unattainable beauty is what Sauron is trying to reenact almost in his own way, re recreate that kind of thing in his own image, and he can never succeed. And that alone is what, like, you know, he's he, t he has tears in that next scene when the orcs come in and find him with Celebrimbor just mm -hmm. stuck up on the end of this this pike. And, uh, yeah, he's he feels genuinely affected by that. And it's still so weird that they've made Sauron such a compelling and emotional character when we're used to him as a faceless evil. And at the beginning of this season, I wasn't sure I bought it. By the end of this season, I do. And I think that's a real achievement because I was really wondering how they were going to make it work with Sauron having been such a human character in season one and then being revealed to be Sauron at the end. I kind of went, no, I don't, I don't really buy this guy being Sauron yet. And now I do. So that makes me wonder what about the rest of the season, some of the stuff that I thought was maybe a little lacking in explanation or real kind of concrete power behind it. What's going to be given more context in future seasons that I will then look back and go, well, I can see where they were going with this now. And it was just maybe disappointing to me in the moment. I think that's how I felt about the dwarves. Yeah. I like all the performances, but I felt the overall character arcs for some well i shouldn't say character arcs the plot 
push for the dwarves I felt was the same. Every time we stepped in with them, it was basically like the ring is manipulating the king. The king is on a one-track mind. It's just greed. It's just dig. It's just inward. He's on a collision course with the Balrog at that Basically, point, and there's really yeah. not a whole lot they can do about it. Yeah, you know, and you're just like, well, just could you? If this is what's going to happen, then just could you speed it up? Because like every time we stop in with you guys, it's just going to be the same thing. I still very much enjoy the relationship between uh, Prince Durin and Issa, uh, his wife. I their dynamic is really cool, and I like the conversations between Durin and his father. I, I like that, despite being a rough and gruff dwarf, that Durin, Prince Durin. Um, will still appeal to his dad, you know, like it's not just a king. Like, it's just, do you remember when we used to arm wrestle? Like, yeah, I, I always, yeah, I always looked up to you as a kid. Like, there's a lot of emotional pulls there, and I and I did like that. But I did find that the, the I mean, they teased the Balrog at the end of the last season. They've shown bits of it here in this season, and eventually you have um, the, the the Balrog appearing and fighting Durin and uh, and the king is kind of like the I guess climax of that story for the king, but it just it all seemed to happen so quickly, and then yeah, also not they're not still dealing with it. Like it just it happens the once you're like, what happened? Did the Balrog just go away? Did it decide to go back into a hole? Like it is, it really felt kind of like this huge moment that had no fallout. <laughs> like it just yeah, it, it didn't really seem like it was exactly. I would have thought that the Balrog being released would have been the end of Khazad-dûm. Like that is where yeah. it really starts to fall apart quickly. Not just the death of the king. Like I thought this Balrog would be killing all kinds of dwarfs left, right, and center, you know, uh, and then become yeah. the ruler of Moria himself, you know, but I, that's not what happens. It, it was still cool visually. Like <laughs> it is kind of funny to see a dwarf like leaping into the air with an ax held overhead at this giant Balrog. His legs, for whatever reason, there's a point in that slow motion jump where his legs are just like out to either side and he looks like a little kind of leprechaun almost, which is an awful thing to say about dwarves, I know. But like, he, he just has this kind of like jolly, almost spring in his step, little pointy shoes kind of like look to him. And like every time it gets to that shot, I've, I've rewatched the episode a couple of times now. I laugh every time, even though it's such a serious, emotional and climactic moment. There's just one frame where his legs just look like Kink. it's just like a little kind of jolly man having a little bit of a jump uh, with a giant axe aiming towards this giant flaming demon um it rules um honestly yeah i like you i think the characters are all so likable i think the location is cool and mm. while we understand what happens to kazadoom we know it will become moria it still feels like there are stakes in that rogue one sort of way where like you understand that all of this is going to be you know, in service of the rebels getting the Death Star plans, but this is a suicide mission, we understand that. It's still a compelling story. And I think the dwarves are like that. I agree, it feels a little bit one note after a while because it, they come back to it a couple of times and it's like, yep, the king's still greedy and, you know, this is just kind of showing the, the downfall. But I think that's important scene setting for understanding the way dwarf society ends up by the end of that and almost prefigures some of the stuff you see in the hobbit with thorin being so possessive of the horde of erebor and the dragon sickness and the arcan stone and all of the stuff that takes place there um but i think the balrog being there is weird i think historically speaking whenever people have read about the downfall of moria you assume the balrog is one event and there isn't really a reason why, it's just that Tolkien doesn't write, the Balrog appears, and then they drive it back, and then the Balrog appears again, and then they drive it back, and then finally the Balrog appears and ends everything. It's always sort of assumed to be one event because he doesn't expand on that. And so the show taking the liberty of expanding on that, it, it has some roots in ideas that Tolkien lays out, but I don't think it's necessarily what everyone was expecting going into this because you see this giant flaming demon emerging from a pit and you're like okay world ending event for these guys and yet the king going to attack it there being that giant explosion rocks fall and then that tunnel is just kind of sealed off and you sort of assume that the balrog would be powerful enough if it's still alive down there to break its way through that and continue to wreak havoc but they sort of haven't established the boundaries of what this Balrog is capable of. Maybe it's still waking up. Maybe it's still a little bit sleepy. And this is just like, you know, the first thing it does when it gets up is try and kill this angry dwarf. But I think it's it's unclear whether we expect the Balrog to come back multiple times 
And since this Balrog eventually becomes known as Durin's Bane because it destroys Moria in the reign of Durin the Sixth, I think, in the book, um, maybe it comes back and is is effectively responsible for the downfall of every Durin in the line. So it kills Durin the Third. Durin the Fourth takes over maybe towards the end of this season, during the fourth dies to the Balrog as well. And then every Durin ultimately has an encounter with the Balrog, and it ends with Durin the Sixth and the Collapse of Moria. We still don't know if they're going to show that in the show, because that's technically something that should take place in the Third Age, which seems out of the scope of this show, but right. you can imagine them wanting to depict it, because there isn't really a reason to set another show in the early Third Age and and show the stuff that takes place before the War of the Ring and the Lord of the Rings trilogy because there's not really a whole lot else that t tends to happen <laughs> around that time. It's just like Sauron is amassing power again and, you know, the elves are all leaving and it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot they can do with that. So I would not be surprised if they accelerate the timeline there ever so slightly just to be able to show the grandiose nature of the downfall of khazad Doom. And I was thinking too that the presence of the Balrog and now with Sauron and the Uruks united um, he could either point them towards that darkness. Uh, I feel like there was a hint at some point in the season that Sauron was aware of the Balrog. Yeah, yeah. Like he he comes to visit them. He's trying to bargain for more mithril, and he sees the Balrog in a flame nearby. There's right. just a very brief flash of it rising out of a flame, but it's more of a like a, a premonition or a, an intuition that he has rather than it being mm. something that's physically there that other people could see yeah yeah it's like the path that you're on if i can keep you digging then you'll eventually just bring your own demise yeah. which again like that's something that saron doesn't do and that he doesn't necessarily confront his enemies head on he tends to either point them to their own demise or pit enemies of his own against one another and have them just like just you know kill them kill each other and so i don't have to bother with you uh yeah. he does it with uh adder uh he twists the the orcs and they put on a ruse to say that you know sauron tried to manipulate your first in command to um rebel against you and he resisted and so sauron tried to kill him and then what really all he needed to do was get him to kneel down next to him so he could stab him in the side and then they all just kill him kill adar in the same way that they killed sauron in the in the yeah. prologue for the season and that's so petty as well because they're killing him in exactly the same way it's like sauron has remembered this for thousands of years <laughs> and then it's like i'm gonna kill you the exact same way you killed me take that is that how much time has passed like that i don't i don't get that communicated to me at all that it's been yeah, thousands of years it's it's difficult because in the first episode they show you that flashback which is sauron like in his previous form mm -hmm. and the orcs all stabbing him julius caesar style and 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 killing him right and then that when it's it's got like an on-screen like a lower third thing that says forward waith dawn of the second age and it's never clearly communicated within the show how long an age of middle earth is but by tolkien's calendar it's about three or four thousand years and so that's supposed to be sauron at the beginning of the second age he gets killed and then that cave that the essence of him like drips down into at one point it fades to black and then it fades back in on the same scene and you're like huh okay i thought we were going to change location but what that's really doing is showing the passage of time because if you compare before and after that fade to black the cave has a ton more like stalactites stalagmites like mineral deposits everywhere uh... the structure of the cave has changed and that's supposed to imply that literally hundreds and maybe thousands of years have passed because there's been enough time for stalagmites to form in this cave and that's one of the things in this show that really rewards a rewatch and kind of shows up as a detail but is almost unclear to the viewer on first watch and that's one of the things i think really lets this show down is that they are trying to draw attention to stuff like that in subtle ways but it never quite hits on the first watch and it's something that i don't know if it's the cinematography i don't know if it's that we we're just not supposed to know what we're looking at i'm not sure if it's the fact that they used a fade to black there instead of just cross fading from one to the other to show the right. stalagmite growing while it's still there there's just little production decisions that don't necessarily guide the viewer towards the right conclusion all of the time. And I think that's one of the things that lets the show down, ultimately, is that there's some stuff that it's great that it's rewarding on a, a second or third watch, but we should have known that up front because it's 
actually kind of crucial information to us. They have to be vague about the timeline anyway because they are compressing events and like certain characters in this because they want to keep the same actors weren't alive at the same time in in the same age in um in Tolkien's like timeline of the whole second age but they have to do that for the sake of the show otherwise they'd be making massive leaps in time constantly but it's still a little bit unclear moments like that in ways that it would not be much to clarify just put like a date on screen or something and then be like or put like 2000 years later when they show the next shot of the cave yeah i was thinking about that as you were speaking like they could put some sort of like visual indicator on screen but again if they're manipulating it from the original timeline then they're just gonna get the deluge of friends being just like that's not when that happened and yeah if exactly, you're vague yeah. about it then it's up for interpretation rather than just flat out saying we've changed it deal with it and i i think that might be um the reason behind that decision but i agree with you like there's a i think there's a couple of things where they could benefit from realizing that not everyone that watches this show is going to be as steeped in Lord of the Rings lore as others, and they could use a little bit more of a handhold. I, I do yeah. find that there's been some good emotional scenes where two characters are coming together, and um, for you, it's been an episode, but for them, it's been a long time, like a year yeah. or a season, and they don't seem to do very well visually with the world. They don't show like autumn leaves. That, like They don't show much changing. There's not been any winter that I can see. And so I don't get the feeling of how much time has passed. And at least I catch on with two characters being like, it's been a long time since I've seen you, my friend. And you're just like, how long has it been? The way that they're acting, they're acting like it's been a really long time, not just a month, you know, like not just a, however long it took to ride from uh, Eregion to, you know, Khazad-dun on horseback. Like that, that's what I thought in my head was like, no, this seems like these two haven't seen each other in a really long time. So yeah. that kind of stuff kind of helped me realize, okay, well, things are moving a little bit farther. And it helps you also with the deception that Sauron is running and the, the quote unquote long game and why this mis miscommunication has evolved into almost spite or uncomfortable silence between people. And it's just like, yeah. wait a minute. Like, this isn't just an argument that they had yesterday. Like this is like a beef that's been going on for months or years. And that's something I thought they were going to do when the dwarves had to stay and like Durin had to keep the army at Casa Dune to secure Casa Dune and fight his father's designs on mining um, instead of going to help Elrond and the elves. I thought, oh, that's going to be like the rift. That's where the we promise we will come. And then we break our promise. And that's like the big rift between elves and dwarves for the next, you know, several thousand years. But then the dwarves yeah. show up at the end. At the end, the, the, the other dwarves show up after King Durin the third dies. Um, yeah. The, the dwarves show up. I was like, oh, okay. So that isn't the rift. So when does the rift happen? I, like, yeah, just, so I thought they were kind of lining it up. But then like, because I was like, okay, I, I understand what's happening here. It's sad, but I get it. And and Elrond did a good job. Like, like he felt heartbroken and. Robert Ar Arameo is, it's great. Uh, but yeah. It just, yeah, yeah. You're just like, but you did all that work and all that emotion for just like the dwarves to show up two episodes later. I just, it felt weird. There is a lot of historical beef between dwarves and elves anyway. And so it sort of falls back into that pattern. It's kind of a cycle that they're doomed to repeat slightly. But I, I wonder if that's going to maybe come back around when Khazad Doom is being felled by the Balrog eventually. And if that becomes something where like the elves can't be there for the dwarves, and so maybe that's where a rift forms. And it's it's difficult to say. Like we're forecasting stuff that may or may not be in future seasons of the show. Um, but in the Battle of Eregion, from what we understand of it from Tolkien's writing, um, the dwarves do help, and they even smuggle refugees out of Eregion as Sauron is sacking it with his army. Um, they they smuggle them through Kazadum through like the gate that they showed them creating the 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 doors of durin um they and they go out the other side and that's where lothlorien is and so i thought at the end of this season where they show them all in that kind of more peaceful valley i was like is that meant to be lothlorien it's actually meant to be rivendell mm -hmm. 
and and that's a fun note as well like they they say geographically where it is they say it's kind of to the the northwest or something and so that that very clearly signposted it as as rivendell but yeah i think the the dwarf elf dynamic has potential to come under some strain but i think in that case they are trying to adhere to both the emotional stakes of whether or not the dwarves are going to show up and also the fact that in Tolkien's canon, they do. <laughs> and so Durin isn't necessarily there in person, so Elrond still feels like there's a distance between him and his friend, but the dwarves are still able to come and help with the with the fight. Um, it was really cool seeing the dwarves fighting as well. Like, obviously there are axes, there are crossbows. Like, it feels like an, an additional dynamic as opposed to the elves more, like, fluid and, you know, uh, archery-based or, like, the kind of beautiful curved sword kind of combat that they have. And it's it's really well choreographed like the distinction between the way the elves fight versus how the orcs fight which is very kind of shambling and stabbing motions and that kind of thing so that there's there's a lot of really really cool stuff in the in the combat sequence which is basically the entirety of episode seven um and that's that's really fun it felt like the show was really building to that event the fall of Eregion is a a really important event in the calendar and is one a lot of people were looking forward to and i think that element i think they really did justice i think there's some stuff they didn't get to do justice to and there's a mix of reasons why. I think um, Arendir shows up in uh, episode seven and becomes basically part of the elf faction at that point, where previously he's been this kind of lone wolf elf uh, in the Southlands and then in the kind of mixed up in Isildur's story in Pelagir, um, which is one of the Numenorean colonies. And I do wonder whether Arendir would still have ended up joining the elf side if they hadn't had to axe Bronwyn's story for season two because of the actress stepping down and... Uh, going to work on like activism stuff instead of uh, instead of acting on on screen. Um, I do wish like some of the other supporting characters had a bit more to do, and some of the characters who were really firmly founded in season one felt like they didn't have as much to do in season two. Isildur being one of them. I think there's still some really interesting stuff with him early in the season, but then later it just becomes about. Is he going to Numenor? Is he not going to Numenor? Will he stay here? Will he kind of... The, the bonds he's forming in Middle-earth and the weird romance that forms between him and a girl who stabbed him in the leg once. Yeah. I still don't understand quite... Like I, I recognize that some of what they're doing with that character is showing reasons for him to become disaffected with Numenor and fall in love with Middle-earth. And a way to do that is obviously to have him fall in love with a character, like a literal love with a character uh, from Middle-earth. And so I get that they're trying to set up a love interest for him to give him a reason to come back to Middle-earth, considering that he still talks very highly of Numenor, even though we know Numenor is kind of going under this political upheaval and potentially collapsing under its own hubris. Um, but he's not party to any of that because he's still stranded in Middle-earth. And so they are setting up reasons for him to want to come back to Middle-earth, I suppose. But it still feels kind of crowbarred in because they lost the love interest story of Arendir and Bronwyn for season two. Yeah, that felt forced, the love story between Isildur and, and the Middle-earth character it just it never really landed with me i mean i could see the i guess the acting was fine but i just it didn't i didn't understand it from like a plot yeah standpoint it just it felt weird because she betrays him in a number of occasions it's not just once folks don't don't marry a woman who stabs you that's all i'm saying yeah, like you're probably not a good i've idea. been been happily married for 13 years as of this year never been stabbed by my partner once so it's <laughs> doesn't set a good precedent for Isildur's future relationships that's all I'm saying and <laughs> Isildur is is one of those characters who we know is going to be the one who like doesn't dispose of the ring when he should have and everything right so like I get that they are setting up uh, uh, Isildur and Elendil are almost like foils of each other like they're they're father and son but Isildur has a lot of flaws that Elendil doesn't have or like Elendil is meant to be the sort of incredibly noble figure and and kingly and responsible and you know almost tragic to that point like the the stuff that happens with him in Numenor we'll get to in a second but I think Isildur is really meant to be like the the flip side of that like all of the flaws sort of manifesting themselves a lot more human than Elendil feels Elendil feels like this mythic character of legend whereas Isildur feels like a guy who can mess up and messes up constantly but is always doing so in service of finding the right path yeah the Numenor stuff is for me I think the l of least interest. I, I understand that it's the starting point of a lot of stuff 
Uh, yeah. I think that's where, what's the Sildor's father's name? Elendil. Elendil. That's where Elendil gets the sword. He gets... Narsil. Narsil. That, that eventually becomes Aragorn's sword, uh, Anduril. Yeah. Yeah. It, Again, everything has like five names in Tolkien. It's the worst. <laughs> they do. They do a lot of like origins. Like here's the here's the name drop or the thing that you wanted to see or like this ties in. Here's the thing from Lord of the Rings. Here's a Palantir. You like, and I feel like for me because I'm so unfamiliar with Numenor, uh, that it it just kind of felt that's the that's the part where it really feels like Game of Thrones, uh, because yeah. you've got the uh, Farazhan us usurping the throne, uh, despite the fact that the queen got spit out by the sea creature, uh, and yeah. <laughs> blessed, yeah. blessed it... by the sea. All that that entire sequence was massive and had all the support for the queen. Didn't matter in the end. As we've learned from Monty Python, strange women in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it it seems to be <laughs> seems to apparently be the case in Numenor as well. Yeah, it's. It, it works in a sense. I feel like they are maybe, again, struggling to communicate some of the ideas that they have. And I think the ideas that they have actually work a lot of the time. There's a section towards the end, I think it happens in the final episode, where Farazon is still going around rounding up the faithful of Numenor, even though their queen is shown to have been legitimate in front of God and everyone. And... Uh, I guess because Farazon has started using the Palantir, even though he's confiscated it and it's supposed to be this heretical artifact to their whole philosophy of Numenorians being in charge of their own stuff. And he sees Sauron in that, maybe recognizes that he is Sauron from those visions, but then that's the excuse that is used to go and continue rounding up uh, Miriel's faithful because she basically sent them to war on Sauron's behalf and they are now learning the context of that. They're now understanding that, hey, that guy we sent everybody over to Middle-earth because he said he needed an army, that was the Dark Lord <laughs> and Miriel has been in league with him this entire time is the way they are posturing it. But that isn't, again, that isn't thoroughly explained. Uh, a guy just holds up a sheet of paper and goes, Sauron? And then they go, seize them! And then that's it, you know? Mm. Like, it's not it's not as, like, overly stated. And it's another one of those situations where I think the writers of the show have convinced themselves we need to do showing and not telling. Because that's the old adage, right? You show and not tell and you don't have all of the exposition happen in the form of dialogue it needs to be concrete and on screen but they're almost doing too much of the showing in a way like there still needs to be a balance it's not show not tell it's show and also tell when either would be appropriate and when you have the ability to do so and yeah it's it's a much more nuanced way of having to think about it but unfortunately i think so many of those details are not immediately obvious and so it feels like everyone's just doing stuff because I don't know. I do stuff. <laughs> it, it it gets a little bit uh, a little bit tricky to 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 keep it all straight with with Numenor. I think Numenor is still such a compelling setting. Um, I wish we'd been able to spend more time with Elendil's daughter, who basically takes a massive heel turn in this season because she's grieving the fact that Isildur was left behind in Middle Earth, presumably dead, and they have another like sibling in that family um elendil has another son who is out in the west of numenor with what remains of the faithful who live in their own kind of colony on the on the shores of numenor nearest valinor but um he's just not in the picture they haven't cast him in the show he hasn't appeared yet he might be in season three for all we know but in the meantime aarian takes like this stance of well no we have to conform to the the king's men the like numenorean kind of nationalist faction and is you know obviously in deep with kemen like they are presumably a couple at this point and so she ends up acting so far against the interests of her own father in a way that feels really out of character for her by this point and you sort of end up hating her almost as much as you hate kemen even though kemen is definitely the worst character he's like the joffrey oh, of this show so um much, and yeah you, you 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 when whenever he gets his arm broken in that one scene and you're like yes break this man's arm like you feel no remorse for it whatsoever and uh yeah i think aarian is just kind of second fiddle to that and she's supposed to be more sympathetic but then she goes and helps elendil towards the end 
and I don't feel like enough time is really given to develop her to the point where she feels like she's a complex character. It's another one of those things that I really wish they'd given more time to because she's not a point of view character. More of her motivations are just like what I what I need to really understand why that character is doing what she's doing. Yeah, you know, the Kemen character just makes my skin crawl. And it's it's that trope of a person with immense authority that didn't earn it that yes. is doing yeah. things that don't like he doesn't deserve the power so anything that he does is just weak despite that it's a show of strength like it's it's it, it seems on the surface like it's a show of strength but it's the exact opposite from a character you know development standpoint and yeah wines is kind of high pitched is uh just outside of of his depth and and this is going to sound kind of funny but like doesn't have the physical stature to warrant yeah. the authority that he wields especially not with a broken arm no well that's, that, but that's the, and the guy broke his arm with one hand like it's just it's, yeah. <laughs> it's just like he's so weak physically it's like you don't just like you're not a leader in any way shape or form you're only there because your father has like put you there dude there's an absolutely wild scene between him and Farazon in which Farazon says to him, basically, like, you need to be a useful tool to me. And he, he frames it like, you know, your mother, before she died, predicted that you would come to ill ends. He basically says, like, your mother said that you would die horribly. And he's like, what did she say? And he's like, be useful to me and I will tell you. I'm like, imagine like in a carrot and stick scenario that the carrot you're dangling for this kid is your mom would told me once how badly you would mess up and die. <laughs> like, that's not a healthy relationship. It's oh, the no. most toxic dynamic you can imagine. And like, he's playing that. And, and Farazon is that evil of a character, but Kemin is still so compelled to act based on this really awful situation with his father and so like you can kind of understand why he is the slime ball that he is but man he's easy to hate like it's genuinely one of those love to hate characters and i think the actor does a phenomenal job of oh, playing yes. that and i wouldn't wish it on anybody because as with like the, the actor who played joffrey who i think quit acting and went back into academia after game of thrones i can imagine that you get a little bit of heat for it even though you know people should understand that you're just playing a character, right? Especially when it becomes a big role or your big breakout role, because I've not seen um, Leon Woodham in anything. So like, this is my first experience with him. So like, it's going to stick because not only is it a big role, but it's a memorable role. It's, it's a widely watched, you know, show. So yeah, I, I can, I can feel for the actors that are dealing with that kind of stuff. I, I mean, in the same, in the reverse, you know, you've got someone like Morpheth Clark who plays Galadriel, and I'm just like, I've not seen her in anything either, but I will lovely, you know, and, and happily watch her in, in other things, but I just, I will be hard pressed not to think of her as Galadriel for the rest of the time that I see her on screen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've done that with Kate Blanchett where, and I think to Kate Blanchett's credit, I, I don't always think about her as Galadriel. It depends on, I think, how she's on screen. Like if she's, just playing a person, you know, on screen with her natural kind of blonde hair color, it's it's kind of hard not to see Galadriel, just because I've seen yeah. Lord of the Rings so much. But then, like, if she's playing Hela in Thor Ragnarok, I just I don't at all think about her as <laughs> Galadriel of in course. that role, right? Yeah, because it's just like her hair is a completely different color. She's got a helmet on half the time. There's just all kinds of different stuff. But but yeah, I feel like those roles kind of stick with um, the actors for for good or ill. Sometimes I I really enjoy Gandalf. Uh, the, how they rolled with the, the stranger and moving the 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 character through the different trials and, and stuff the, the 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 amount of dialogue and the economy of dialogue for who will eventually become gandalf this season was fantastic i really i really enjoyed a lot of it i am curious though because i am not a fan of tom bombadil in the books and mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of purists out there that are. And so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mind the, the, the sequences in, in the, the, where the, the Badlands, where they, what's the area that they're in? It's Rune, I Rune. guess is probably yeah. the best. Yeah. So he's in Rune and he runs into Tom Bambadil, uh, Gandalf does. And I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. I'm actually going to get like a visual representation. I'm still trying to figure out what or who Tom Bambadil is. I don't know whether he's the same as Gandalf. He's just been there longer. 
uh, yeah. or what? Like you it, and you and the rest of the fandom, Joel. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think honestly, the reason people like Tom Bombadil at all, like honestly, I find the character on the page a little bit annoying. He's like talking in verse the entire time, mm-hmm. and his his whole section of Fellowship of the Ring, the reason it was cut from the theatrical movies, is that it's just a diversion into fairyland, and then changes nothing about the plot. It's literally just like get whisked away to a magical place where a man will sing you a song, and then you know you get eaten by a tree and he pulls you out of the tree and he gives you a supper and a bath and then sends you on your way and he's there basically just to rescue them from the barrow whites um, which also get a name drop in the same uh episode that they introduced tom bombadil which is kind of funny they were like let's just do this chapter of fellowship of the ring in rings of power but tom bombadil is never explained like at all it is one of the secrets tolkien took to his grave like who is tom bombadil what's his whole deal and he describes himself both in the book and in the sections of the book that they pulled for the show as being the eldest creature in all of Middle Earth. Like he remembers the dark under the sky or under the stars um, when it was fearless, like when there were no harmful things active in Middle Earth before the elves were even born, um, he was there. And so the notion is that he is in some way related to the creation of the world. There are some people who've suspected that he's basically the physical manifestation of creation itself. And he's just this jolly man who lives in a cottage and has a wife who's a river spirit and kind of lives his life and is cool with that. And he is referred to as the master, as though he is master of everything around him. But also in this show, he is teaching Gandalf, you don't really want to be the master. You don't want to impose your will over stuff. You want to be in balance with your surroundings, like I was saying earlier. And Tom Bombadil has always been a mystery. Like, I'm still on the fence about them including him in the show. They they add a lot of old, new context to old material, which is kind of fun, but his voice, uh, as it appears in the book, is very difficult to capture. It's hard to make him not feel incredibly twee. And I can see why they didn't end up writing much original dialogue for him, because it feels very flip-flop. Like, he feels very irreverent, and not at all serious in the book, even though serious events are unfolding. But then in this show, he's also delivering these very almost stern lessons to Gandalf about, you know, how he has to find his staff and how it's ultimately his destiny to confront both this dark wizard who's at work in Rune and also Sauron, which obviously, again, lays out the idea that he is Gandalf and he'll be a a key figure in the War of the Ring and ultimately in Sauron's downfall. But man, it's it's really difficult to give Tom Bombadil exposition when his whole thing in Fellowship of the Ring is obfuscation and just a, a, a casual side story in fairyland for a chapter. And it's the first time that I've noticed, at least in the last few episodes, where they started to pull quotes or partial quotes from Lord of the Rings. Oh, they're all over the place in in Tom Bombadil, yeah. One of the, I mean, one of the ones I really like is the one about pity, and um, there, it's it's when in the movies, it's when Gandalf is talking to Frodo about pity and Gollum. It's like many creatures deserve life, some deserve death. Are you the one that's going to be able to give it to them? Like, don't be so quick to deal out death and judgment, that kind of stuff. And yeah, and you get it in here and from Tom Bombadil as well when I think he's talking about the other men that are chasing them or something about the, the, the warriors of Rune and talking to, to, to Gandalf and th- they start dropping all those, uh, those kind of quotes. And to, to a point I was like, I, I get it. Like I, I sort of got the whole caretaker thing. Like I got the whole, you know, if, if Gandalf's a Maiar and there's more of those, some of them have landed before Gandalf and they have arisen to power. And then he's going to rise to power and he's maybe a strong one. Um, but then Tom Bombadil knows the Dark Wizard, tried to steer the Dark Wizard towards the right path, but the Dark Wizard chose the dark path. And you kind of get that idea where you've seen in other fantasy stories and genres where there's just a character that your protagonist encounters that is the fork in the road. You know, like it's the guide. It's the Obi Wan yeah. Kenobi moment, you know. In some ways, it's mm-hmm. more obvious in Star Wars. You got Obi Wan Kenobi and Yoda. In other cases, um, well, I guess you know Yoda is a really good example, actually, because at the time, you know, when you see Empire Strikes Back, you don't know where Yoda's from. You don't know what Yoda yeah. used to be. You don't know anything about this little green dude that has the power of the Force and teaches everybody. Like you, you just don't know. You just have to take it at face value that he is 
good and a guide and will help Luke, you know, achieve what he needs to achieve. And I, and I think that that's true of Tom Bombadil. Like that's kind of what I get from it is that he's more of a, a signpost, like a janitor, like a caretaker of, you know, middle earth uh, as a whole yeah. and kind of like knows all and sees all, but is also outside of it and doesn't want to mess with it. Like he just, is just kind of like here to see it develop, but also kind of try to steer it in the right way. And there's a, I don't want to say, I guess it's a modesty to that, that I find appealing. I like the actor that played him. I thought that, you know, like the delivery in the dialogue, like it was still interesting, even though I don't enjoy that part of the book, I did think like, oh, okay, well, this is going to be different. I wonder how they're going to handle this. And yeah, again, like I liked the fact that it was almost like a therapy session where, you know, <laughs> Gandalf yeah. would, Gandalf would ask a question. It's like, so am I to take on the dark Lord? Like, is that my destiny? And of course, Tom's like, do you think it's your destiny? Like, how do you feel yeah. about that? It's like, oh, it's totally <laughs> like, come on, yeah. man. Like, I mean, Gandalf's looking for answers and all the guys doing his questions. And it's just obviously, um, at the end, Gandalf says like, I was meant to choose, uh, the, the side of like, not the power, but decide to choose friendship over power, I think is what he says. Uh, and then eventually find his staff. I, I did find that was a little bit of a, I just tripped over it. Like, <laughs> like yeah. in some ways it's very Tolkien. But in other ways, it was very kind of like, that's a little convenient. I, I was hoping for a little bit more of a moment. Obviously, he has a moment when he picks it up and you re you recognize it because they they obviously made it look very much like the twisty, you know, head of the staff that that he has in, in the movies. Um, but I, I I did like the the naming of him. I was hoping actually it was going to be like a little bit more subtle in that Gandalf wouldn't necessarily choose his name. Yeah, they, they kind of beat you over the head with it by the end, don't yeah. they? Yeah, well, I, I like the idea of them calling him a Grand Elf and then that not, that being his name for a while and then just over the years, people just mispronounce it and shorten it into Gandalf, right? Like, rather yeah. than him picking the sound of it and calling himself Gandalf, I kind of figured that other people would call him Gandalf and that's how we'd get his name. I, I thought yeah. that that would be a better way to handle it, but like, whatever, they, 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 they went the way that they went. And I'm glad that they didn't leave that hanging for another season because I think it was pretty obvious by the time we got to the, I'd say midway through the season, you're like, this is Gandalf. This has to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pe people were saying that obviously at the end of season one where he gives the always follow your nose line. Um, and I was like, the, the thing is, they're still taking Gandalf out to Rune and using him to tell the story of the Blue Wizards, which is kind of, you know, the the the, the story that takes place in rune but tolkien never fully fleshed out exactly what happened there there are a couple of different versions of it and i think that's I, i'm satisfied with the fact that it's gandalf i think it's fine the stuff i'm not satisfied with is the second half of the season for the harfoots and gandalf kind of felt like it backed off a lot on what they were trying to do like it had a good first half and a lousy back half for me agreed um i think the show wanted more screen time for the Keller Brimbor stuff, and I think is wise to do that. Like, that story really feels like it was done justice by the amount of time they gave it. But that, in later episodes, led to us getting a, a quick jump to Rune, where Gandalf is standing on a cliff with Tom Bombadil going, which one of these trees is my staff? And that's all you see of them in that episode. And... It also shifts away from Nori as a POV character. Like, it feels like we barely check in with Nori at all, and it's much more about Gandalf, which I suppose you want it to be, because Gandalf is obviously a broader figure in the wider story of everything. But it felt like, by the end, especially in episode 8, it really lacks the connecting tissue that helps it feel like a complete story. We don't get the A to B of, like, how Gandalf even finds the store settlement. He just kind of wanders in there at night... And everything is blacked out. For a start, it's a day for night scene, and all of the day for night scenes are far too dark. <laughs> We've obviously got problems with like it being Amazon and like the Amazon streaming thing, like not showing darker scenes particularly well anyway. But you you really wish that you had some context to the Harfoots having been captured by the the Easterlings, the Gaudrim, 
and the Dark Wizard is already there, and, like, it really felt like it missed a scene in between those two things of, like, how do these characters get to here? Do the stores even put up a fight? Because they they have that scene previously of, like, you know, they're sharpening sticks and they're, like, you know, milking venom out of a snake at one point when Poppy and her love interest have, like, a little kiss, and that's kind of cute, I guess. But then, like, they're clearly gearing up for a fight, and the fight never happens on screen. We just get the, oh, they've been captured now, and... I felt that was a really poor handling of it, and it was probably just because of time, because of budget, possibly even because they were heavily affected by the writers and actors strikes last year. I just don't think they ended up doing with it what they set up to do. Like, they, they nailed the setup and botched the payoff. Um, the masked Easterners got very little payoff either. Like, they had this whole sort of foreshadowing of, like, when we return, you'll understand why we wear these masks. Never mentioned again. Like, it, it didn't, like, they clearly have this thing with the Dark Wizard and he's cursed them or whatever. Nothing about that was ever revealed. The guy just gets thrown against a wall and may as well not turn up in Season 3. Unless they decide to do something with that in Season 3, but it already feels like we're moving on from Rune, at least from the Harfoot's perspective and Gandalf is going to stay there and figure out what's going on with this wizard. But it, it feels like it set up a bunch of stuff in the same way that it was setting up. He's going to find his staff, he's going to recognize what his name is, but then they didn't pay off like half of the stuff that was happening in Rune. What I really wanted them to do was parallel the scene in Bree when the Dark Riders invade and Frodo and Aragorn and the others are all hiding in the other inn and then the Dark Riders come in and stab a bunch of pillows and stuff. I thought it would have been great for them to have a similar scene to that with the masked, like, bug-like mask guys coming into the store town and then maybe them resisting a little bit and trying to put up a fight but ultimately getting overwhelmed. But we just never saw that. It was all done from Gandalf's perspective. He walks in you know, it's already over. And I felt that was just kind of an unfortunate waste when it felt like they were building up to something bigger there and instead what we get is the Siege of Eregion happening in a completely different place. I felt that it was disjointed storytelling. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that's I, it. I think that if I was to guess, it feels like there's a bunch of stuff that hit the cutting room floor that they just were editing for time. And, yeah, you yeah. Because they, they, because you you look at the, what they were doing in terms of the prep and the production and that that set piece, like that's a huge amount of time and money invested. And I feel like they were leading up to something, and then they just for whatever reason they decided to try to work around it, despite having filmed it, and maybe it just didn't read right, or I I don't know what the reasons might have been, but it did it did feel odd. Uh, and unfortunately, I feel like it it like you said whiffed the landing because. Even when Nori has tears streaming down her face and like, you know, the, the idea of Nori and her people have never had a home. These people that they've encountered have never left their home. And now because Nori and Poppy showed up um, and have, they feel like they've been the catalyst to these events, they are now forced from their home and they have to become nomads. So the very thing that they had yearned for, uh, they have, they felt responsible for taking from these people. Uh, and she has this emotional moment of wanting to separate and go her separate ways from from Gandalf. I don't know why. Uh, and obviously, it's supposed to be a sad parting because this friendship is what has taught Gandalf to choose uh, love and friendship over power. Uh, and she walks away without even giving him a hug. Like it just it, just, it yeah. feels really odd. You know what I think that is? It's probably just that they didn't have scale doubles. Like, obviously, all of the stuff that happens in Lord of the Rings is because they had, like, uh, little people actors and, like, taller folks to represent Gandalf in the scenes where, you know, Elijah Wood was supposed to be, like, on screen hugging Gandalf, right? And they did, like, an over-the-shoulder shot, so it's mm. difficult to tell the perspective. They don't do as much of that in this show. And it's a lot of cutting between, like, the stranger up here framed in a way that makes him look tall and then the half down there like walking by his side but they didn't have scale doubles for that scene for whatever reason and again i think that's actor strike stuff i think there was reshoots and and like poor planning in terms of the production and i just don't think they were able to execute that in a way that felt satisfying which is a real shame and now unfortunately it seems like the way the show is taking it is that those characters are going to be separated at least for a while and I'm really curious to see if they even go anywhere with Nori and the Harfoot store faction in season three, because as far as we know, Nori's whole job is just to lead the rest of them to what will eventually be the Shire. Mm -hmm. And 
where's the tension in that like where's the story do we go back to something like we got with the Harfoots in season one where they're just being nomadic and encountering challenges along the way do they end up walking through some of these like battle zones of you know areas like Mordor and and Aragian or do they just end up like popping up later and they've already found a place to dig a hole in a hill and call it home you know yeah I don't know if I want to watch just more walking of the the Harfwits. I mean, they're cute and they're, it's fun to see their little dynamics. And uh, I do really like Poppy and Nori as a dynamic, but I like it. They just, it's not the most interesting part of the show. And I just, I feel like a lot of times it's such a pace change. Like you go from these battle scenes in a to, uh, you know, Poppy and is it no name? Nobody. I Nobody. Think a, yeah. Yeah. Having like a little sit down and a little kiss. And you're just like, okay, look, it's fine but like just it, it's a really drastic shift rather than yeah. going from like Eregion to Numenor to Poppy like there's they they cut these massive swaths through um the pacing of the show with some of the things that are not landing well for me so it's hard um to think about I at least with the elves I did enjoy the the way that they wrapped it up with the the fight with Sauron and Galadriel and then eventually the the king um high king and the elves saying like you know we're choosing the sword like we are choosing to fight you know yeah. sauron and try to, to try to rally rather than go and hide and turtle and wait for them to show up at our doorstep we can um choose to fight for what's good and galadriel's um i guess moving forward the wisdom of Celebrimbor, which was if you've got hope and light then you can fight the darkness it's not with force it's with um attitude and with um the i guess the camaraderie that comes with that is how you win over sauron as opposed to being aggressive and playing into his hand i guess was the the message yeah. and i i really liked that and i i did find the 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 final battle between galadriel and sauron to be a little bit on the why are we doing this for so long side it was still cool but like she's got a ring that heals her he doesn't seem to take much physical damage and we both know that they don't die you know like just yeah you know, like yeah it's 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 a, it's a weird sort of like it's like watching i mean like you it's different when it's like darth vader and obi-wan kenobi because you know that neither one of them die in season in episode three because they're obviously they're both in the other movies but you're watching to see how vader becomes vader like you're watching to see that yeah. fallout and in this year, it's like, I don't know that there's going to be any great change here. Like, I mean, Galadriel is obviously going to not die and neither is Sauron because you know that he gets the rings and eventually becomes the Dark Lord. Like, it just, it's a weird kind of way that they they do the dance. I did enjoy him trying to manipulate her, like appearing as different characters, even appearing as her and appearing as... <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, and even planting that seed of like the Dark Queen, like that the, the, the Dark Queen mm -hmm. scene that we see in Fellowship when she explains to Frodo what it is to have a ring of power um the kind of the foreshadowing there was kind of cool i also did enjoy the fact that um he stabbed her with the crown and similar to uh the morgul blade at weathertop it's also yeah like in her and and i think that in that scene where elrond and uh the king heal galadriel you also realize that because of that wound, like she's now trapped, she has to wear the ring. It's probably what's keeping her alive. I mean, it could well be, yeah. There's also that notion of, A, like when she wakes up, she's in Rivendell in the same way that Frodo was mm -hmm. after he's healed by Elrond. Uh, and so Elrond starting his career of healing off on a real strong one. Um, also, yeah, like the notion that Galadriel has been cured of the darkness at that point. Like, if Gil-galad and Elrond successfully drove out whatever was at work in her, then she might be freed of other dark influences as well, including the manipulation of Sauron. So I feel like while obviously that fight does drag on a little bit and you feel like, yeah, they're just kind of fighting and in you know he, she, she kicks him down into the next stage of the fight almost like it's a, a fighting game where you throw somebody through a roof and the, the the combat continues it's still like she's exorcising her demons she is ridding herself of any compulsion she felt to be united with sauron on anything 
And it's interesting that that comes after she was very close to forming an alliance of sorts with Adar and the Orcs, because for a second, Adar cures himself of the corruption using her ring because he's wearing it and he looks like a normal elf and then he takes it off and starts to become an orc again and that's a really cool effect i really like the way they did that but ultimately it's doing the same thing for her uh, and and ridding herself of any notion that she had kinship with sauron in the way that she and halbran have that little moment after the fight near mount doom i think it's um it, it's really meant to be her shedding that aspect of herself shedding any kind of connection to sauron rejecting that in favor of the light and that being what moves forward but when she wakes up in rivendell she she's dressed almost like frodo finds her in lothlorien she's in this kind of white more like flowing robe instead of the armor mm -hmm. and everything so i wonder if this marks the start of a shift in galadriel's character where as we move into season three we'll start to see more of the galadriel that we know from lothlorien yeah, I mean, that would make sense to me. I feel like, again, she's probably going to be more of a spiritual leader, a, you know, morale uh, compass, I think, for the elves than, than the yeah. militaristic general that she's been so far. I, I think, uh, is it Arendir? Yeah, Arendir comes in and even says general, like calls her general uh, at, yeah. that, at that time. And I think that there's a there's definitely a shift there for sure. And and really well portrayed by Morpheth Clark too. Like you get you get it, you get the emotional shift and you you understand the the sacrifice that she makes too like i mean she knows that she's putting herself in in serious harm but i think she also understands that by keeping the ring and jumping off the cliff that she's not going to die like I think there's a there's a sacrifice there's a physical pain sacrifice that's happening um there in order to keep the ring from sauron although i was thinking there like when elrond uses her ring to help heal her with the king like through all of this, where's the third elven ring? Like I know it's on <laughs> the other guy, but like where is he? Kirdan still has it. Yeah, that that's the thing. Like we see very little of Kirdan. His role in all of like the elf society is to stay at the Grey Havens and keep building ships, and they've given him the rings to dispose of, and he ends up wearing one, and that's sort of him claiming it, and he sort of seems like the wisest and oldest of the elves who are still in Middle Earth but he his role is very static he never gets involved in combat he is literally like i'm the ferryman basically like he's more or less charon from greek myth he's like right. ferrying people to the afterlife but um eventually his ring is given to gandalf so it will get its airtime eventually <laughs> but right now yeah it, he's not the kind of person who rides into combat and like the three rings together it's not like captain planet and the planeteers where it's necessarily going to solve all of their problems if anything, the Elven Rings represent this sort of stasis, and so I think Kirdan being a very static character almost plays into that aspect of the Elven Rings. But you're right, it, it does feel very strange from the perspective of somebody who's just watching the show to be like, well, they've got two powerful rings in play, why don't they bring in the third? Because that surely would like tip the scale ever so slightly, or at least introduce the balance that they insisted was so important to the Elven Rings in the end of Season 1. So, yeah, I I agree. It feels a little bit strange from the perspective of the show, but I think in terms of just Tolkien canon, there's a solid reason for it. Um, what are you looking forward to in season three? Like, is there any aspect of this that you still feel like is unresolved or like what characters are you looking forward to tracking when we get into the third season? Well, I mean, now that you've mentioned it, I forgot that Gandalf ends up with the Elven Ring of Power. So I'm curious if he's going to not necessarily get it, but like have an encounter with Kurdan. Uh, yeah in season three because he's off on his own now and who knows where he's going again I, I think it's one of my favorite actors and characters in the show so i'm just i've always been a gandalf fan so having like an origin story yeah. for gandalf is gonna be really cool that or he's gonna be confronting the dark wizard um and i think that, that yeah could be, that could be a really interesting i i mean at the same time like there's only so much you can do in a wizard fight so like I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to go but i i can see them at least addressing that because otherwise the dark wizard is just going to do what like whatever he's doing on a, unopposed so i feel like there's going to be some sort of i don't want to say score to settle but some sort of wrong to be righted before gandalf can move on i do get that feeling that gandalf is just going to be like this nomad of like discovering friends and realizing oh you've got some trouble friends i can help you with that and then just do yeah the, do the thing and then move on to the next thing and each thing becoming bigger and more important than the last as he gains wisdom power you know perspective all that kind of stuff so i mean i'm and i'm down for watching that if it's if it's portrayed well um i 
again, I think that Galadriel is one of my favorite characters, and I would be very much interested to see how she changes in season three and Elrond as well. Uh, again, a mysterious kind of character in the Lord of the Rings films where you just, he's just kind of there and obviously a very powerful elf and, you know, the leader in that particular, you know, realm, but how does he get there? You know, like what, what does building Rivendell look like? I think that that could be some very interesting, um, interesting stuff. Although that seems like it's going to come later because the elves are just going to battle right now. And I'm curious to see what that looks like. I mean, the action in the show is very good. So if we get more of that, I think that it'll be a good balance. Um, that's one thing I did feel was, was good about this season is that there was some emotional head scenes. There was some like talking and, and political scenes, but it was pretty well balanced with some cool fight scenes, the grandiose stuff, the strategy, like blocking the river, the troll fighting in the, in the battle, yeah, um, the dread that came with that. And, and the, even like the laughter of the troll as it died, like just it's this, the, there are still some creatures and some things in middle earth that are just hell bent on death and destruction because it makes them giggle. And I think that that's kind of cool to have around, uh, these like dangers that are not necessarily on any one side. They're just doing it because like they get kicks out of it. And I think that that's going to be, you know, interesting to see what else they bring. We didn't touch on it much, but we saw some ants in the season. Yes. Uh, yes, which we was did. very cool, including an end wife which we have never <laughs> encountered before uh, and yeah. we have since lost. But uh, like, I thought that was cool. And there was even a nod to that when uh, Kemen was giving orders to the people of the settlement saying like, how hard can it be? They're just trees. And like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Isildur and uh, the kid look at each other like, um, actually <laughs> this yeah. could be, this could be really problematic, you know? So I, I think that there's going to be, more frustration with the you know spread of Numenor and the politics uh there um I don't know like I I liked the season I liked the first three episodes I found them pretty gripping but uh, as I mentioned I just did not get through a single episode in one sitting for the other five I watched yeah. them I enjoyed them but like I'd get halfway through episode five and then I'd watch the rest of it and then I'd watch the first 20 minutes of episode six and then I'd either get distracted or I'd I'd have to come back to it later and then I'd pick up and watch again like it just it didn't feel like it was structured in a way where at the end of every episode I was on the edge of my seat and I couldn't wait for next week you know like it did, it did not have yeah. that going for it um I also unfortunately as a viewing experience uh i'm dealing with ads on prime i don't pay extra yeah to get rid of the ads uh i was someone that was happily paying for prime for a while to, and had no ads and now that they've injected ads into my tier it really pisses me off and yeah same they are really disruptive like they they yeah. are, there's only two ads in the whole hour long show um they're the same two ads that play but there's two ad breaks and they're just they're louder they're horribly produced. They're not even like good ads. They're just like lawyer. I get ads for a law firm that I've never heard of. Like it just, it really, it's <laughs> oh, no. not even relevant, you know, like they're not even targeted yeah. to like, Amazon has a lot of information on my shopping. Like give me the ads, like to, to advertise for cameras and stuff. Like just why, like, why am I getting ads for a law firm that I'm like, I'm not even, they're in like a different city. There might even be an American law firm. Like why, why am I getting it? So that kind of stuff I find really disruptive. So there are some things about the, the third season that I'm not looking forward to, but I do, I do hope that they can at least continue with some of the character development that I like. And the relationship between Elrond and Galadriel is interesting. And I, I like the fact that there's a lot of relationships in this show that are love, but it's friendship love. And I like that, um, that bond that they show in, in certain characters. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's hard to predict. Cause like, it's like you said, like, it's a great visual show. It's a great escape, but I don't love it. Like, I'm not telling everybody to go watch Rings of Power. I'm watching it because it's cool fantasy television, but it's not like something I'm talking about with friends outside of this podcast. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Like, for me, I think I'm looking forward to seeing what in season three retroactively improves season two. And I think that's true of season two retroactively improving season one in the sense that we get more context for why the heck Sauron is doing what he's doing. And we get like a little bit of like a trickle of information about some other things. We get an understanding of this being Gandalf. So now if you if you go back and rewatch the origins of the stranger in season one, understanding that this is 
the origin story for Gandalf, then maybe that adds some element of depth to it that you haven't seen previously. So I'm hoping that we get more context for what's going on with the Numenorean characters so the reasons that that fell flat are resolved retroactively. And, you know, it's not like everything has to be retcon, but I presume they have at least an arc that they have planned for Season 3. Um, I would like to see anything that can be done to salvage what's happening in Rune with the Dark Wizard character, because for a start, just calling him the Dark Wizard over and over again really doesn't help. I think the fact that we've been calling Gandalf the Stranger for as long as we have has started to wear thin, so I'm happy they've dealt with that, but they haven't named the Dark Wizard. And if they do, I'm thinking about the characters who they have the rights to name. If he ends up being Saruman, I'm going to be like, what are we all doing here? Mm. Like, I, that, that feels to me even if both of those characters end up dying and they have that kind of like brain reset that seems to have happened with Gandalf when he came to Middle-earth as a meteor, um, it just strikes me as one of those why doesn't Darth Vader recognize his old protocol, protocol droid moments? Like, if it, it really genuinely feels like, oh, these characters should know each other. Even the fact that the Dark Wizard calls him old friend a few times has everyone's, like, alerts raised of like, oh, this is probably Saruman. Um, maybe just because that's the only character they have the rights to show as a wizard other than radagast and if this being radagast would be a wild swing um but i i think there's there's moments like that that i think because they aren't structuring these like the peter jackson movies and they don't have the structure of lord of the rings being three individual books they don't have the structure of that for the events of the second age it's harder for them to find breakpoints. It's harder for them to satisfyingly conclude arcs when they also want there to be a five-season arc for the entire show. And so a lot of stuff gets left behind that is maybe picked up later. And I'm wondering if the future seasons are going to really help with a lot of the stuff that I find challenging about season two and will let me enjoy it more in retrospect. That's ultimately my hope. And the the places that can really happen is with Numenor, um, with some of the stuff that's happening with the dwarves. They mention at the end of the dwarf segment that Durin has a brother who's potentially got a claim to the throne, who maybe got a mention at one point, but we really don't know anything about that. So there's still a lot of loose ends they have left that I'm waiting for them to tie up and move on to future events that I know are on the way. But... Yeah, overall, like I said, I'm still pretty happy with my assessment. This is an 8 out of 10 series that looks like a 10 out of 10 series. And I'm still looking forward to more, but I'm happy to wait for it. Well, I, I'm happy that you were able to come on and talk about it because it, I think it's just a, a fun treat to have, you know, someone that's so familiar with the Tolkien lore and, you know, someone that also enjoys the show but has the same critical thoughts about it to, to talk about it. So obviously we'll have to have you back on when uh, season three premieres. As as is the tradition now, like we've started. The yeah, thing. we started the thing and now we have to complete the thing. <laughs> of course, we'd love to uh, see, see you in two years, probably. Right. But, uh, yeah, obviously, yeah. obviously, you, you and I have plenty of stuff to take care of before that. Yeah, of course. Of course. Moving on to the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member-only Discord server that's shared with my personal Discord. And access, of course, to the Barista Cut bonus audio sessions whenever we record those. Special thanks go to our Bean Counter patrons, Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support on this episode. Patron count is at 23. That's down one from the last time we recorded, which means there's always room for more. If you would like to be patron number 24, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I have a quick and seasonal pick this week. And yes, it's Lego. It is the Lego Disney Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas set, which is part of Lego Ideas uh, and has made its way to an official Lego set. It is set number 21351. There are 2,193 pieces. Like this is, that's a lot. This is a, a large set. Uh, retails for $259.99 Canadian, 13 inches high, 21 inches wide, and 11 inches deep. So it's one of those diorama of sets where it's got several buildings and a bunch of different stuff happening. It's a little cross section of the town with Pumpkin Jack's house, and the town hall and the iconic uh, pumpkin patch with the curled vine that that Jack and Sally uh, sing on. 
There are Jack, Sally, Zero, Santa, Lock, Stock, and Barrel, and the Mayor as minifigs. And yes, Jack is an extra tall minifig. He's got long legs and uh, he stands a head taller <laughs> than other minifigs, which I think is pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, it is surprisingly angular, twisty, and curvy for a Lego set. Like I am impressed that they were able to capture so much of that Tim Burton twisty off kilter design uh, in the Lego set. It's really, really well done. I mean, even the chimneys aren't straight. The trees are all twisted and weird. Like it's really very well done and not overly large. It looks like it might even be modular. Like it looks like the, the three pieces are built separately and then you can kind of connect them at the base, uh, the pumpkin patch, Jack's house and the town hall. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of little things like the, the bathtub that has feet that walks around for lock, stock and barrel. That's something that you can build. Uh, Santa has a candy cane and a beard. So there's um there's a bunch of little stuff in there. And I think they did a really good job. I, I'm impressed. It is uh, currently not available. It will ship in 60 days from Lego. You can order it now. Um, so it, it's in time for Christmas, but not in time for Halloween. Uh, just in time for Halloween spirit, I guess, is why I wanted to share it. Because I'm always at odds as to when I want to watch The Nightmare Before Christmas. I used to watch it almost annually. And now it's just like, do I watch it at Halloween? It's more of a Christmas movie, but it does have yeah. a lot of Halloween <laughs> stuff. So it's like, you almost want to watch it in November sometime as like to maybe sort of get yourself ready for Christmas, but it's not really like it's, it's a hard one to kind of nail down, but it's definitely marketed as a Christmas property. Yeah. So it makes sense that the delivery before Christmas could happen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a really charming set. And like you, I am genuinely surprised they managed to capture the angularity of these builds the kind of top heavy diamond shape of them mm -hmm. in 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 lego but that works spectacularly well it's it's very cute well that wraps up this episode of the citadel cafe you can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that johnny and i talked about at the citadelcafe.com music for the show is composed by kevin mcleod you can email the show at the citadelcafe at gmail.com or follow the show by name on social media Subscribe for free on all of the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. The RSS feed and show notes are available on our website every time we publish a show. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell friends about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything that I am doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes links to my other podcasts that I do with Johnny, the Minecraft podcast, spawnchunks.com. Uh, that is also something we talked about recently on the Imp and Skiz podcast. There's a lot of stuff out there in recent weeks uh, for me and Johnny. So if you're interested at all, then check out the Spawn Chunks as well as the Imp and Skiz podcast. I'm Joel Duggan on Twitch. I will be streaming later today as well as almost every day now, except for Mondays and Sundays. So if you're interested in Minecraft and Satisfactory, I usually start streaming around 1 p.m. Atlantic. That's UTC minus four hours. And again, that's Joel Duggan on Twitch. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about anything, but obviously Lord of the Rings is, is a fun treat. Where can people find you and everything that you're doing online? As usual, you can find me at youtube.com slash pixelriffs. The Minecraft Survival Guide Season 3 continues apace. I'm now working on The Windy City, which is inspired by wind charges, giant fans everywhere, the breeze, and wind power and flight in general so having a lot of fun with that you'll hear more about that on the spawn chunks podcast of course but if you want to swing by the youtube channel i'm uploading a little bit more frequently than i have done over the rest of september and october uh aside from that three days a week on twitch tuesdays thursdays and sundays although this sunday as of this recording is going to be uh, a dungeons and dragons with the 8-bit community so that's going to be hopefully me running them through their morkborg adventure for the first time if you want to get a little peek at what i was talking about earlier in the show and some of the uh, the the local DMing I've been doing of different uh, TTRPG systems, then you can find that over at the 8-Bit Community's Twitch channel, 8-Bit underscore community. Um, yeah, aside from that, I am on Twitter and Instagram, at PixelRiffs. Don't at me about your Lord of the Rings opinions, <laughs> because uh, I I don't know. I'm, I'm moving on from this show and on to other things. But uh, yeah, like you can find me there if you're interested in keeping track of everything else I'm doing. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap but you can only pick two.